Hello, and welcome back to another meeting of the Geek Cabal, Cabal Whisperings. Uh, this is episode number 17. Uh, today's date is December 7th, uh, 2023. And if you hear noises and see the camera shaking and stuff, uh, we've got a kitten in the room here, another one. So this makes number three for me uh, that we're watching at the moment. And uh, he seems to be a little working, or a little wrecking crew on uh, everything and can't seem to behave himself. So I apologize ahead of time if there's any sort of uh, mic disruptions or any of that, or just noises in general. He'll or prob- for old camera. Just- but anyways, that's probably actually make this a little bit more exciting podcast because uh, right now our uh, schedule is kind of light on uh, topics to talk about. Yeah. Um. I mean, so, Jim, before we continue, do you know the historical significance of today's date, by any chance? Uh, 1942, the... Um, 41. 41, whatever. The, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes. There we go. I know some things, maybe not exactly the date, but... Um, which does actually bring up, at least partially, uh, one of the top, talking points that uh, we have is that uh, in yeah. Channel News... We had a review of Godzilla minus one, which definitely takes place in the uh, uh, in Japan right after World War II. So, kind of very topical about the time. Uh, very good movie, very good review. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I'd recommend watching the movie first, then going to check out a review and seeing if you agree with it. Um, but from every reviewer I've seen so far across the board, most of them have given it, you know, glowing reviews. So. And I think they just they, they pulled off a great movie, a great story, and um, a compelling one. So um, makes me wonder if they'll actually maybe either invest in an English dub or some sort of other release over here. So hard to say. I know they've already extended the uh, release of it, um, or the uh, it's it's release over here for an extended period of time because of how well it's doing. Yeah, who knows? Uh, Besides that, you you just had another video that went up. Which one was that? Uh, Let's see. Uh, The uh, Lego collecting video, video number three, where I kind of talk about uh, if you're looking more towards uh, buying these as a uh, as with intent to resell. Which, as I stated in the video, and I'll state again here, I'm not an investment manager of any kind. None of that in the video is investment advice. I just talk about what's worked for me in the past that I'm assuming is going to work in the future, but it's up to you to do your own due diligence on that. So, uh, But that was a re-record because the sound wasn't quite where I wanted it to be on the first one uh, and trimmed about 15 minutes off the video, too. So now we have that. Uh, Owen's video for the, uh, the Hunt for Red October. I have that in the editor right now. Because I was redoing the the intro music for our reviews, because I still had the old intro music, and I was trying to find a decent song for it, and hopefully I did. We'll see. Um, you should have done the uh, uh, Command and Conquer Red Alert uh, theme. Well, I'm, I'm still not 100 <laughs> certain like what music we can actually use. I know. We can't. I probably couldn't use that either. Probably not. Even though Westwood Studios is no longer a thing, they're owned by EA. EA yeah. So. Well, and e, you know, yeah, we don't want EA coming after us no, because we're using no, I, music. I, I don't want old ruin everything to come after us. So, uh, there, we'll there, just buy our podcast. There you go. Then, uh, let's see. Then they'll have a few episodes that kind of suck, and then they'll, they'll shutter it because that's what they do with everything. Hey, if I get paid a, you know, well, yeah, ton I mean, of money. hey, they want to throw some money our way. We'll just do what, uh, Oh, I'll remember his name here in just a second. He's, he's a Hollywood guy. He's been producing movies forever. Um, he, uh, I'll think of his name here in a second. But he, that's what he's done several times. Like, he makes a bunch of movies, sells his catalog and everything in the studio, then just like a week later just starts up another studio with like half the same people and just starts making movies again. He's done it like three or four times. And uh, Well, you know, and like people would be like, oh, you're a sellout if you, you know, do them like, I don't think you're really a sellout if you go from make, having no monies, making nothing, to... Because it's like, who wouldn't, you know, who wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I, you know. Like, hell, be even George Lucas. Like, I mean, they threw billions of dollars at George Lucas. Well, and at some point, you're going to be like... I, I think I think in that particular instance... He could have made billions of dollars, though, too. I, I, think, I think that was George Lucas looking for an out. 
and Disney happened to have the offer. Yeah. I think I think it was more there. But to your point, yes, if you're a, if you're a creative type and you have built a catalog of material and someone's offering you a mountain of money, I mean, it's hard to say no to that. You just understand that in the future you're going to, have to make something else. You know. Yeah, well, and like I say, George Lucas is not a very good example because he could have also made billions of dollars if he wanted to keep making movies. Presumably, yeah. Um, but, I, I mean, for like the average Joe, these small studios that get bought up by EA, I mean, EA comes in with a slow sum of money and they're like, we'll do all this. I mean, they don't sell out because they're like, oh, no, they're like, this is a life-changing amount of money that they're being offered. Right. Um uh, I mean, and it sucks because, yes, good studios do go down the toilet from that. Um, but at the same time, how long can these st- studios last on their own? Well, I mean, like like with Westwood, uh, the one good thing that did come out of it is we got the remastered original Command and & Conquer and original Red Alert. And I see rumors online that a remastered Red Alert 2 is in the works, which that will be spectacular because Red Alert 2 is like, it's 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 the good one that people still play like twenty years later. Uh, Red Alert Three just has the crazy Ow. cut scenes with Tim Curry and yeah. uh, uh, Sulu. Peace. Yeah. Sorry yeah. that I just made a face on camera for those people. Uh, it's a great thing about kittens with murder mittens that they. Uh, uh, well, well you surprising. Uh, being surprised by the claws digging into my leg. Well, I, I can't even begin to do a good Tim Curry impression, but you need to do what he did and escape to the one place uncorrupted by capitalism. The space. space. <laughs> the problem is, space is the next place for capitalism to well, go. Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I happen to think if we go, the, if we somehow make it to other planets of the future, it's going to look a lot more like Alien or Star Wars and a lot less like Star Trek. Like, yeah, which is unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate because, uh, um, well, at some point when we ever get around to putting together the, uh, the next set of mock pixel sets that I bought, which are more Star Trek ones, um, I just like to do that. I'm just talking about Star Trek and you know, kind of the, the reasons why it's probably uh, hell on while the others have faltered. Not really faltered, just ended at some point. I mean, you know, you're, I mean, the 90s was just a huge time for sci fi shows and. 2000s. Well, I know one of my favorites is from the 90s that, that few people seem to have seen, but everyone that has seen it says it's spectacular. That's right. Babylon 5. Yeah. I mean, the, the effects are dated because they were literally made on a laptop in the 90s. So, well, yeah. you know, you have to get past that part. But if you can, like, the story is spectacular. You know, the story is basically like Lord of the Rings in space, you know, for lack of a better comparison here. Yeah, you had, you had that, you had Farscape, you had... Uh, yeah, I, I watched about half of Farscape, and what I saw was really good. I really need to go back and watch all of it at some point. And then you had Firefly, or is it Firefly? Uh, yeah, Firefly is the, was the show, and then Serenity, Serenity. was the movie. Yep. Unfortunately, yeah. I've only ever seen the movie. I've, I've, seen, I've seen two episodes of the show. Yeah. Well, I think there's only one season of that. Yeah, there's one season. It wasn't all aired. The episodes were shown out of order on Fox, like... It's like it's like Fox is like, yeah, we'll keep making these sci-fi shows, but we're gonna do everything we can to kill them. So, um, but y'all said the X Files for more grounded. Well, I say grounded sci-fi, but it still involved aliens and stuff. Uh, the X Files was spectacular. You know, that was uh, that show was great. But no, no, I thought it was just a good topic because you know Star Trek has died multiple times too, um, and has keep coming back. And uh, well, with the show Enterprise, I mean they. They killed it in the middle of an arc, and we're like, no, 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 we're just going to do this. We're going to also kill off a main character just for whatever reason, and, um, yeah. Hello. Well, Babylon 5 kind of had a, a similar problem. Uh, the creator originally wrote it for five seasons, <laughs> and... Uh, they thought they were going to be canceled at the end of season four. So they wrapped up the five year plan in four years. But then because the ratings were good for season four, like, all right, we're going to give you a fifth season. Like, well, we don't know where to go. Like we did the plan. It's done. So they had to just kind of cobble together a fifth season. So the fifth season is a little bit lesser than the others, but it's still not terrible. And they try to spin off. that didn't quite work, which was a shame. Cause it was kind of good. 
And uh, but I hear they're going to reboot the series or something. And the original creators on board, and probably a new cast, which really sucks because similar to Deep Space Nine, like there was a lot of good actors on there, like that just aren't here anymore, and so they can't reprise their roles. And, yeah, no, I don't think a lot of those shows can afford the to digitally recreate people. Probably not. Uh, and I've also heard, I, I think the, the creator is going to try to go a little bit different way with it, like, I think. So I think his opinion was like, well, we've done the show. We're not just going to redo the show. You know, we're going to try to do something a little bit different this time around. So we'll see where it goes. Um, I know the current show, unless it's moved off, is on HBO Max. Or I guess it's just called Max now which is stupid. I should have kept the HBO logo because no one knows what the hell Max is. Yeah, to me, that makes me think of, like, Cinemax, yeah. Showtime, you know, the Skinemax. Or Mighty Max. The cartoon, did you ever see that? Or Max Headroom. Max Head. There we go, Max Headroom. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, one of the craziest things is when that one guy hijacked that signal in Chicago. I've read about that. <laughs> wearing a Max Headroom mask and, um, like, man, that's just a, that's, a, if you haven't seen anything on that, you should look at it. It's the Max Headroom incident. It's usually how it's listed. Um, cause, yeah, you know, we don't get piracy signals like that anymore, at least not where they don't get caught. Yeah, no, uh, I know Justin and I, one day while we were at work, uh, the radio station we were listening to, something else cut into it. It was definitely like a pirate signal because it was, it was an intentional broadcast and you could tell like it wasn't supposed to be what was, it wasn't what was supposed to be on there. Well, and like radio signals like that can still be interrupted, but most signals now are digital. So trying to, yeah. you know, we don't have antenna signals anymore. That was back when what they did is uh, they overpowered the yeah. ro- local, local tele- television stations, uh, TV signal and was able to broadcast their own over top of it. But yeah, uh, I don't know. We got a couple of the videos, right? We had uh, the Lego video, the Hunt for Red October video, the Godzilla review. There's something else. Oh, uh, we have a new Battletech book review. It's not up as of us recording this, and probably actually won't be out until after this pops up. So uh, look forward to that. And. Uh, Gonna have a little bit of free time in the near future, so hopefully I can plow through a few more Battletech books and get some more reviews up. And I'm gonna try to get into some of the source books also. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Battletech and the gaming because uh, there's something else there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, we rambled on through the uh, channel news there a little bit, uh, which is fine. Like I said, I don't think we have much on the agenda or topic. So yeah, no, this is this is uh, hopefully we're not gonna run three hours like the last time this happened. Well, probably not, because uh, the way things are going, and anyone watching on YouTube right now has probably seen us get uh, clawed by a kitten a couple <laughs> different times. Um, but you don't mean wrong, the kitten's fine, he just wants to play, it's not like it's, you know, whatever, but, um, yeah, murder mittens. Um, anyways, so on to movies, uh, you know, again, I already did my Godzilla Minus One review, so that was the movie that... Which, if you folks haven't watched it, you should. Uh, I, I've watched most of it because I have to edit these, even though I haven't seen the movie yet. And I think Jim and Owen do a really good job in the review, uh, so you should definitely check that out. And it is a spoiler-ridden review. I, like, I, I, I did put a spoiler thing up in it, so yeah. when the spoilers start. Plus, you guys do spell it out. But, yeah, the, like, the last, like, two-thirds of it, it's all spoilers. Yes, so. yeah, I mean, well, there's not a whole lot to talk about. I mean, it's a great-looking movie. And well, sure. Was, Plus, uh, even, plus, even the actual spoilers, a lot of it amounts to, and then the giant fire breathing lizard attacks. Like, you get that from the trailer. So, yes. Well, the one thing to not spoil anything is the way that they did his atomic breath, is they made him a, a nuclear explosion. Mm. So, like, when it goes off, there's mushroom cloud, and the, the cloud going out, and then yeah. the vacuum sucking back in. Huh. All right. Something for me to look forward to. It is. It was... Oh my god! I mean, when we saw that, I mean, all, all of our faces just like. Well, I do know my favorite scene in the uh, the was it 2019. It was a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the the first of the American remakes that kicked off their uh, series with Kong, but the first the Godzilla one. I don't think it was it wasn't King of the Monsters. The one before King of the Monsters. Well, it was two, called Godzilla. That's yeah, 2014. 
2014. Yeah, the 2014 one was the one with the um, um, the Mutos, the yeah. giant insect creature thing. Yeah, well, my favorite scene of that was definitely whenever he finally powered up the the atomic death breath because, like, it was like three fourths way through the movie, and I was like, "Is this going to happen or not?" And then you just see the the spikes starting to light up there in the cloud, and you hear the the the, the noise building, the mm, yeah. kind of noise, and I was like. All right, it's here finally. And I think it's one thing. I, I think maybe Toho actually took, and I don't know if they took inspiration from that or if the U.S. version took inspiration from what Toho has done. But yeah, they it kind of has like that winding up sequence, except for it's a it's done a little bit differently. Like um, his dorsal plates actually like extend out, like they're, okay. they're like they're uh, letting off the excess energy, yeah, kind of thing. So. So we have that. We also have another Godzilla topic to discuss. Yes, another Godzilla trailer. And the, the funny thing is that the people are slamming this thing because the it's... Okay, if you haven't seen the trailer, it's got... Okay, it's, it's, it's Godzilla it, what, X-Con. Godzilla X-Con, okay. So it is a follow-up to Godzilla versus King Kong. It's At, the whole Hollow Earth thing from the end of that movie. So you have... King Kong with a robotic prosthetic or, or like a gauntlet on, uh, which I heard people comparing him to Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> and then you've got um, Godzilla, who now is pink instead of, or the pink energy instead of, uh, which I always see a meme that's talking about pink energy. You gotta watch out for that. Too much of it. Which is, which is fine because he did, Godzilla 2000 actually did have kind of a pinkish purplish color. Um, which I don't have the figure out here. I had it during my review. Um, so you've got that. Then you've got um, a baby con. Yeah. And then you've got like this elderly con that I guess, I don't know if he's bigger or he's bad. If it's, you know, Planet of the Apes, but it's King Con and Godzilla. You know, is it Caesar? I, I don't know. I have well, no idea. I, I know the I know the main part I saw people criticizing was where the two of them take off running after something, and people were like, you know, from a purely physics standpoint, they would both catch on fire at this point because <laughs> the amount of energy they'd have to put out to achieve this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand being a little quicker because sometimes when you're so slow and lumbering, like, but I mean, they're like sprinting. And yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And uh, well, I mean, here here's every once in a while I come across things like that that I'm just like I don't care because I'm already being forced to believe in creatures that are far too large to actually exist because there's all kinds of other physics problems that would cripple them. So them running, sure, I don't care. You know, just as long as we don't see the the tail kick again. Where he slides across the screen on his tail to, to drop yeah. kick somebody essentially from the is it the one of the jet jaguar? Yes, yes, know. that's the uh, Godzilla versus Megalon. Yeah. Um, as long as we don't see that, yep, yeah. I'm fine with it. Okay, but you can you can see like the, the and if you just and, and again if you want to just compare the two Godzilla Godzilla trailers together, compare Godzilla minus one versus the the other one, and you can see there's a huge difference. There's you get a lot of the feeling for the human element in the Japanese one versus, you know, I don't even know if there was a person really in the, I think there was like a, there, there was, there was people from the Godzilla versus Kong movie in the trailer. Uh, the, the girl that signs, yeah. she was in it. And, uh, I guess, is it her mom or adopted mom? Uh, you know, who I'm yeah. talking about, right. She, she was in it. I didn't see, uh, I didn't see whichever scars guard that is. It's not Stellan. It's the other one. Um, and I didn't see anybody from the Godzilla side of the, the movies. Yeah. So, which makes sense, because I don't think any of them went down to the Hollow Earth, right? I think it was just the Kong people at the end of the movie. So, Though, I don't have Apple TV, but the fact that they've got... Oh, the Monarch series? Yes, that looks actually pretty decent, and I am would be half tempted to watch that. I'm about half tempted to see how much it costs to get Apple TV just to... I mean, luckily, you don't have to have an Apple product to do that. It's just... I think my Roku in there can play Apple TV, but yeah, um, it's actually got me interested in, in watching it because it looks pretty decent. Now, is it? Well, let me know if you do because I need to get your login information because there's one movie on there I want to watch. 
is the movie is the story behind Tetris. Like, I want to see that. Well, when we get into the gaming section, the um, speaking of that, uh, the uh, the King of Khan is, uh, I guess, being you know he's been trying to sue a bunch of people for uh, defamation. Invalid, yeah, and I'm guessing like the tides are turning against him. So, um, well, let's not risk it. Well, no, because he'll probably sue us. And, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, he wouldn't be able to prove damages. But. Yeah, because we're only referring to other things. Like, oh, we're not saying yay or nay, we're just... Yeah, well, that, and like... Okay, so so 20 people are going to watch our thing. What's that going to do to his... What, how does that financially translate to damages to him, is what I'm saying. Well, they'll stop buying his hot sauce. Oh, well... He okay. makes hot sauce. I did not know that. Yes. So... Well, anyway. Uh, so we got those. Uh, apparently, Disney has basically given up on the Marvels. Uh, if I saw it correctly, they're going to stop reporting international sales. So it's just going to peter out now at like less than $100 million domestically is where it's going to end up. Yeah, that's really rough. It's less than $200 million globally. Well, you know, and the problem is, is like, I think just like as its own thing, just like its own movie, I don't think it was a, I don't think it was terrible. No, it, I mean, it, 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 and again, not saying it was, the best movie or whatever. I mean, it was one that I watched. I didn't go and leave and go, gosh, I wish I hadn't seen that. The Eternals that happened, like the Eternals had some good looking scenes, but overall I was just like, that was a waste of time. It was, so I recall you're at that point about a third of the way into the movie. What? As far as thinking it was a waste of time. Yeah. The only thing you turned to me, you said something and I had to remind you there were nine main cast members. We'd only met three of them at that point. Now, like I said, the fight scene at the end looked good, but Almost that entire movie, I'm like, is this thing over? The Marvels, I thought I, I was, I was entertained, and you know, it, it, this may sound crazy, but like if it came on TV, I probably could sit there and watch it again. I don't think it was unwatchable. I, don't, I mean, Spider Man Three for me is unwatchable. Um, I just, I don't know, the emo Peter scene, just, I, I can't do it. That seems great. I can't do that. I, it's so much cringe that I cringe myself out of watching the movie because I can't do it. But yet the Marvels, I'd go watch again. Now, um, I have now Wish, on the other hand. Um, there was a couple of things that I heard about Wish that made me think, I'm glad I don't want to go watch this movie or none of my kids want to go watch it. Um, because uh, the, I guess the whole premise of Wish is that the the, the bad guy is supposed to be able to grant people wishes, but he holds back and only yeah. grants wishes that are not like going to affect him. And the woman, the, 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 the main lead uh, uh, woman character is going to try to be able to grant everybody's wishes, which pretty much just means you can have whatever you want whenever you want it. Someone didn't watch wonder woman 1984 because actually a lot of people did and didn't do very good. But the point <laughs> is, this was covered in that movie. Like you start granting everyone's wishes. Like some people have really, really awful wishes that will affect a lot of people. You know, and from what I gathered, you know, my main takeaway is, yeah, maybe the guy's kind of a, you know, maybe he's kind of an, you know, dick about it. But at the same time, you have to have some restraint on if you had the ability to grant wishes to only grant the ones that truly need to be granted versus just granting every wish to everybody. Because if you do that, you know, one, nobody will do anything. No one will take accountability. It'll just be like, oh, I screwed up. Well, I wish I didn't do that. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to remember Wonder Woman 1984. There was a couple of people whose wishes were essentially like, I, I wish this entire group of people was just gone kind of wishes. And like, you're going to have that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because I mean. Or, or someone's going to be like, I wish to have the powers of a god or something. And, you know, they're not going to use them wisely. So. What other plus it's a plus I mean without having watched the movie, is it a matter of like she thinks she's just gonna be able to psychically know their desire? Are they gonna have to come and tell her their wish? Like, cause what if she, what if she what if she does that and it's like instant like reads their mind or something and catches someone in a bad moment like I wish you were dead, you know? <laughs> then they are because that happens in Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. So like, because Maxwell Lord's power is just like 
go off. He he basically becomes one with the thing that is granting him wishes. Yeah. And so he just like goes global on TV and just like grants everyone's wishes. And yeah, there's a lot of really bad things happen at that point. But then Wonder Woman uses the power of love, compassion, friendship, something, I don't know, to convince everyone to willingly give up their wishes. Which that that was the most fantastic thing in the entire movie, because that would never happen. Yeah, no. Like not in a million years. You know, and you think you'd be doing making that move and you'd have to be like, listen, like I get that this is a superhero movie, it's supposed to be whatever, but don't you see the 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 flaws in what you're asking for people to do here? Yeah. But You would think so, but Oh well. So yeah, like I said, they're they're not gonna be reporting some of the box office numbers. They've basically given up on the Marvels. Uh and there's this also led to some other articles basically saying that Disney's gonna lose will have lost hundreds of millions of dollars this year. Uh based on projections of several movies that they thought were going to be billion dollar movies. And, uh, I don't know. I've seen one guy's analysis who kind of went through and, uh, he's, he's a comic book guy. And I, I don't know. I, some of his takes, I just, I just don't know where he's coming from. Like on this one, he just goes through these movies and he's like, well, half these were never going to be billion dollar movies to begin with. I'm like, well, now I didn't think the first captain Marvel was, but it was, you know, so, like, I can understand why Marvel would think that perhaps, well, before it got to this point, I could see where they think the Marvels would be. I could see where they thought their Ant-Man 3 was going to be, because they made it very clear that Kang was the villain and Kang's the new hotness. So, like, you know, I could see where they would think that, you know, and uh, what else came out between those two? Oh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, Guardians of the Galaxy should have been a billion-dollar movie. It was really good. And I think the only thing dragging it down was the fact, oddly enough, that it was connected to the MCU because, like, things are going downhill, so other things connected to it are being sucked down with it. Yeah, and, I mean, that's unfortunate because, that's again, we've commented on before that toxic fandom can be a bad thing. Like, when people boycotted Solo because of The Last Jedi. Yeah, well, that's, I don't want that under toxic fandom. Like, like The Last Jedi was awful. I know. No, 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 so, no, 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 no. But putting out another movie, put it, you know, like not even giving Solo a chance. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, you do you. You know, if if you don't want to see some, you know, don't go and see it. But I don't know. I thought Solo was a decent movie. Well, I thought so too, and I I think we're in agreement that that's probably what happened with Solo. Well, that and the fact that literally nobody was asking for a Han Solo prequel. But and and don't get me wrong, like. Some of the changes in Solo, I was just like, eh, like the Kessel run, eh. you know, the, uh, the the mines of Kessel. It wasn't supposed to be an asteroid, and instead it was a planet. I think so. And so, like the spice mines were still there. Well, yeah, it's just that they were also storing the it was it coaxium. Well, they were. I guess they were mining coaxium, which makes sense if you were if 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 with where you're mining the spice, you can mine something else. Yeah. You know. Yes, you get the, uh, you know, the extra profit there. I'm sure the Ferengi. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's covered in multiple rules of acquisition among the Ferengi. Oh, gosh, the people, some Star Wars fans are like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> well, you, you need to, if you're going to go into business, you need to know the rules of acquisition. Uh, I am disappointed in one thing from Solo, though. We never got, I don't think we ever got a, a regular toy or a Lego set of that one, like, modified heavy laser cannon TIE fighter. And we only saw the one of it, so who the hell knows where or why they even existed, but, like, I would have liked a Lego set of that one. You know? Just because it's, cause it's that weird one-off kind of thing there. Oh, yeah. I was surprised we've never seen them again in anything else. I mean, I could, like, from a, from a realistic standpoint, that thing's got to be incredibly difficult to aim, because the pod is, like, so much farther over from you. But against a capital ship, it doesn't matter because they're so big, you know. But uh, no, I just wish we would have gotten a Lego set of that, and I don't think we will at this point. Well, because we got from other other figures. Um, didn't they even make one of the train? Yeah, they made one of the train, and the train had the train's the only set that we ever seen those uh, kind of heavy armored, like ice, not snow troopers, but like stormtroopers. 
That's the only Lego set there, Ian. And you also got the uh, Lando's Millennium Falcon. Yeah. With the uh, escape pod attached to the front. Yeah. And it had, and they had regular TIE fighters. I th- in fact, I think the TIE fighters I have are either from Solo or from just before that. Because they're the ones that have the bigger wings like they're supposed to have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the unfortunate things with some of the Lego Star Wars stuff. Is these one-off movies, they make like one batch of sets for them. Maybe a second batch and that's it. Like Rogue One had, I think, one batch of sets. Which is a shame because they're all really good sets. You know, speaking of, you know, I know you said nobody's clamoring for it, was never clamoring for a solo movie, but you know, Disney Plus would be the perfect place to do these like these like Star Wars stories, just a yeah, lower budget, just a a one off, like you know, like the Lando movie. Make, make make it a Disney Plus thing, so you don't have to throw so much budget into it. But hell, it seems like that's where everyone's going, anyways, is to go to you know, like direct to streaming. Yeah, I think the only reason they wouldn't do that at this point is because all these Star Wars shows, they're only getting like 2, 3 million viewers. They're not getting very many people watching them. And so I don't know if that's a case of like, because people just aren't buying Disney Plus, because they just, there's no possible way they're at Star Wars exhaustion. There haven't been that many movies. You know, superhero exhaustion, I didn't ever think it was a real thing, but maybe it is. well, I mean, it, I think, well, it, I don't know if it's even exhaustion. I think it's just an uninter- un- interesting movies that are coming out. Like, well, I, I think, I think, I think you have the two thing. I think you had those two things and COVID just hit all at once. And you had like end game. A lot of people were like, I think I can check out here. Like I, I, I got the good story. Like, I don't think they're going to top this. Like, I, I think this is a good ending. Let's just stop here. I don't think they're going to top it either. I think the only way they can is either Secret Wars or the uh, the Dark Phoenix Saga. I think those are their only realist or... And I say the Secret Wars, I, there's actually two different Secret Wars. It could be the original or the Hickman one. Either one, I think, could do it. But that's probably it. And I think the... I think if they... If... This is a big if. If they... I can't even say because if I say if they learn their lesson, but... There's no lesson to be learned. Like, if they went and did the Fantastic Four, like the comic book Fantastic Four, and just said, let's just, you know, let's write a story that fits very cl- good with what, you know, the, the comic book says for the Fantastic Four. You know, don't deviate from, you know, so much from origins. You can, you know, the origin can be a little bit manipulated. You know, like, okay. So the, not the Roger Corman Fantastic Four, but the, Roger Corman Fantastic Four is the most faithful adaptation out there, Jim. I know, but I'm I'm saying like the um, Roger Corman. That's who I was trying to think of earlier. Thank you. Uh, n- no, the the the, the first uh, released Fantastic, I guess, well, whichever one, the one the with, Fox Fantastic Four. Yes. Um, like, yeah, they weren't just on a spaceship on their own. They were on a space station, which is 100 percent fine. Like, I don't think that origin would have changed enough to warrant a. You know that that people shouldn't have been too upset about. Now the fact well, I mean, that they, in, in the original they steal the spaceship, yeah, just just to go up into I don't remember what the hell they're going up into space for. I think it's to observe the phenomena that ends up hitting them with the cosmic rays. But no, like say they, they yeah, they're up there on Victor Station and they they get bombarded. First of all, you know that is fine. Like I don't see anything wrong with that. And actually, I think the way they did it kind of explains why you know maybe uh, the Thane was so deformed because he was blasted direct on while the others were kind of like through you know other medium which may have lessened their impact a little bit though i don't think any of them really came out much unscathed you can only imagine the human torch during certain situations gets to whatever and just you know flame on sounds like a mall rats level conversation right there yeah, speaking of that, you know, we were debating on having conversations like what ifs and uh, things like that. Uh, you know, talking about comic books, Star Wars, oh, Star Trek. Sure go with what if Kevin Smith didn't make the Masters of the Universe series and we all still had faith in him. Yeah. No, 
The but yes, what the, if conversations. I'm all for it. Yes. Just let us know what you think. If there's, you know, some what if topics. And like again, we're not talking I mean it could be anything. It could like say it could be, you know, what if um Qui-Gon has survived? I mean, there's obviously stories out there. You know, how would that how would have the whole Star Wars trilogy have been different? Actually, more than likely Anakin's turn to the dark side may not have happened. Because I think Qui-Gon was the right person to train him, not Obi Wan. Well, I've seen people speculate that that's why the uh, the song there for the final battle is called "Duel of the Fates," is because that's that's the real heart of that fight is is Anakin's fate and the fact that Qui Gon lost. I mean, obviously it's a prequel, so we know it's predestined, but you know that's that's the that's the pivotal moment that most people overlook. You know, because Qui Gon would have attempted Qui Gon would have attempted to guide him, and Qui Gon also would have been also probably would have understood whenever he ended up with Padme. Would have been yeah. like, I can help you, and I think, I think Obi Wan also would have if he would have confided in him. Yeah, because uh, Obi Wan had the other; he made the the opposite decision that Anakin did. He had, you know, the Duchess that he was yeah. in love with, and he let her go. Yeah, but I, I think that's why the movie set up the way it is, so that we see Obi Wan is forced to take essentially the company line with Anakin, and I think for Anakin, that's the final moment of like, I can't tell him. You know, where he gives him the whole, like, you have to spy on the Chancellor. And he's like, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, you know this is wrong. He's like, well, it's what the Council wants. And he's like, yeah, I think that's the moment where he's like, I can't trust him. Like, he's he's with, he's with 100% with the Jedi. He's never going to see any other way. And I think that's the critical moment there yeah. for him. So, anyways, we are going to do that kind of a spinoff. It'll be a mini-podcast thing that we'll do. Uh, We'll have to figure out what first topic we want. But, you know, definitely if you have any ideas of topic ideas you'd like us to discuss. Now, understand, we aren't all knowing about stuff. So if you come up with something like uh, Battlestar Galactica, what if, and I'm like, that's going to be a, probably a big no for me because. Well, if it's from the new series, I can at least attempt it. I watched about half of it. So, um, and it was also excellent. I need to watch the other half. But usually most comic book stuff, Marvel DC, that is, we're not going to probably be getting, going into image comics very much and digging into it. Yeah. No, for me, I'm not going to be able to. I'm talking about, like, what if the Savage Dragon decided to fight the Malvolgia in hell? Um, but, you know, Marvel, DC, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, you know, Star Trek, you know, stuff like that. You know, if you've got any ideas, any what-ifs you want to hear, you know, let's discuss. You know, let us know in the comments down below. But, <sighs> sorry, with that rambling on. Um, no, that's fine. Um. It's gotten quiet. My kitten's either asleep or is. I see. He's, you know, he's being good, so that's all I gotta say. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We talked about the Furiosa trailer in the last podcast, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. So. Yeah. Well, and I think with all of these movies, I think if they go back to delivering the message in a you know, in a narrative driven way, I think people would definitely probably be in a lot better spot. Uh, I don't think this would help with everything like the MCU and different things like that. I think there's such a focus now on all of these other points. You know, we've talked about them in the past. I don't want to reiterate them because some of them are very sensitive talking points. Um, But again, after watching like Godzilla minus one, there is a compelling narrative there and they tell it in a way without like just having to be like, well, we got to check these boxes. They're like, no, we're going to tell a story about PTSD, you know, and regardless if it's PTSD because Godzilla killed all of his teammates or PTSD because he was a kamikaze pilot that didn't go kamikaze in world war two, whatever that is, they do it in such a way that you can actually, anyone can relate to that, uh, you know, versus, you know, cause they, they had the story and it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't, wasn't driven by some, you know, sort of other narrative. It wasn't check boxes that had to be ticked. It was like, we're going to tell a story about Godzilla and PTSD. Well, right. Here we it's, go. it's like we've, you know, we've talked about Star Trek before, you know, Star Trek obviously has a message to it. It's always been a progressive message. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that because they wove it into a compelling narrative for the most part. Now, Discovery goes a little off the reservation, but 
Well, there is that one episode of The Next Generation that even most of the Next Generation crew are like, yeah, I don't know about this. And that was the one with the um, the tribal people um, where one of the guys wanted to uh, marry Tasha Yar. Oh, yeah. Uh, and even... You, you, you can't get them all right, Jim. <laughs> even most of the cast were like, this <coughs> is me. a... Uh, th- 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 that was not a very good plot, <laughs> good uh, story. Yeah, well, about. I mean, there's, there's other parts of The Next Generation, like... Uh, uh, I don't remember what the episode was, but Data has a conversation with Picard where he's just kind of like, so as near as I can tell throughout human history, like, violence does actually work when achieving political ends. And well, Picard's yeah. like, whoa, whoa, hold on now. Well, they were talking about the, in one of the things, in that there was a, I believe it's the same episode where they actually had to pull it, or pull part of it or edit it, because uh, he mentions the Ireland, uh, the IRA. Oh, yeah, the IRA, yeah. And uh, they were like, no, 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 no. They like The UK was like all up in arms about it yeah. and stuff. Like they had to, you know, either not air that one or edit it or... Uh, but yeah, I mean, you've got that. You've got uh, you got the one that was kind of on the nose in the final season with the uh, the planet that where the Native Americans had relocated to. Yeah. And uh, I mean, now that I think they did it fairly tastefully because even the Enterprise crew was like, Jesus, no, we can't move these people. Like... Do you know what they've been through? Like, I'm not going to do that. And everyone's like, well, by God, you're going to. Like, they ultimately end up to agree to stay with the Cardassians, which does lead me to wonder, did they officially become part of the Dominion? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, I I have to wonder that now. Yeah, they, like, go back and check up on them. (laughs) I mean, I'm assuming they'd be like, yeah, we're not going to fight, guys. Sorry. Like, we're we're just going to stay here. You Go for it, you know. Long live the founders, you know. Oh, there was one that um, that uh, actually people brought up because uh, I mean, obviously, in you know, in the climate today, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, talk about transgendered and all that. And there was one episode with Riker who falls in love with the oh, the where the people are, are non-gendered essentially. Yes, yeah, and. But some of them do express one way or the other, and yeah. yeah. And the thing is, is that uh, supposedly, I guess Jonathan Frakes had actually said it should have been a guy that played that role and not a woman. And you know, but and even in the way that they did it, so the way that they set up that episode it just goes to show that you can have even topics about stuff like you know that that a lot of people find controversial, but you do it in such a way where it flows naturally. It's right, and that's it's that's, not. That's one of the big things that sci-fi tries to do is is a lot of the better sci-fi tries to actually present a topic that's important, but they try to distance it and cloak it behind metaphor and so that it's not just, oh, these are people in the modern day, because then it's all right on the nose, you know, because like, like Blade Runner, you know, the replicants are essentially slaves. So like that, that's part of it, you know, is, is built into it. And so it's, it's metaphor that if you want to, you can totally ignore, and it's just a, a crime noir movie in shitty future Los Angeles, you know, or you can see the deeper meaning behind it. And so, you know. Well, I, I know, and it's it's a thing that I, that some writers should go back and watch these shows and see how they actually handled some of those topics. And, you know, like I said, I actually kind of probably agree with Johnson Frakes on that, that it, it probably wouldn't, have, it probably would have made the episode even more compelling if it would have actually been a male actor versus... Well... Jim, we're going to have a topic under comic books. It's going to, it's going to kind of address some of these little topics. So, but, um, you know, there's again for any of the younger audience in there. If you haven't watched, you know, I'm not saying you should, I, you should go back and watch the original series. But you have to understand the original series was even it was made in the 1960s, and it could come off as a little corny now. But it's really good. It's, uh, it is hit and miss. You know, because some some of the things like um, you know. Being the first interracial on-screen kiss, yeah, between Captain Kirk and Uhura. Um, yeah, I mean, and Michelle Nichols has spoken a few times about how she was going to quit the show, and it was Martin Luther King Jr. who convinced her to stay. You know, trying to explain to her, like, you know, the being in a, in a mainstream production that everybody was watching. You know, it was important. And that, and it showed a future where race didn't mean anything. Like her race really didn't come up in right. the show. 
Right, and likewise with Chekhov, because it's during the Cold War, so they wanted to show a future where, you know, Russians and non-Russians, you know, because Kirk, pre- Kirk is from Iowa, so he's an American, uh, where they all get along. And then you have Spock, who is, is even more beyond that, you know, because he's half of Alien. You know, and that's that's why. You know, that's why they wanted, you know, the mix of the crew like that. And you know, you have Sulu, you know, who is a Japanese with Japanese descent. You know, this is not that long after World War Two, you know. Mm -hmm. You have Scotty, so we have the drunk contingent represented. (laughs) I'm just joking. James Doohan is a treasure and I read a story one time about how he got this uh some kind of fan mail from someone basically saying yep. they're going to kill themselves. Yep. And he's yep. like, he tried to, he's like, well, I've got to get a hold of this person. I can't let this happen. And you know, like how many celebrities actually take the time to do something like that? And he did get a hold of him and stopped him. You know, that's just like, you know, that's, that's just the hell of a person there. You know? I'm still looking for my transparent aluminum though. Yeah. Well, computer. <laughs> um, but no, oh, I have the keyboard. How quaint. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, and then we'll get that into that when we do our, like I said, I, when we're putting together those, uh, those other Star Trek ships, we'll get into talking about the, the, the role of Star Trek and just how it's lasted and stood the test of time, even with shows like Discovery, which again, the first couple of seasons of Discovery wasn't bad. I just, I think they kind of went way off the other end when you pretty much said, oh yeah, Discovery doesn't exist in this timeline. What do you do? Well, you send them to another timeline. And that's when things just kind of got weird with the burn. I never watched past season two, so I can't well, the say. the burn was pretty much a thing that prevented dilithium being used for warp drives. Ooh. As soon as you tried to engage warp, your ship would just explode. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, but they lost like almost the entire Federation fleet because of it. Because I can understand why. Uh, and it was kind of a dumb reasoning why, and uh, you know, it. It lost me. I have I've not been able to get. I tried to watch Discovery after that, and I just couldn't. But the first final, season, the final season's about to come on. I think. Well, I still need to watch the rest of Strange New Worlds. Well, I need. Yeah, I need to finish. I I stopped watching after the first episodes. I'm trying to go back, watch the first episode again, and then stream all that. And then um, the new season of Lower Decks. I haven't watched any of Lower Decks. Lower, you, you tell me it's good, and I see. Okay, to say it's good, so I, I've I've got to watch it. But. It's it, it's good. It's not like a. It's not a masterpiece, but it's 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 good humor. Well, I, I get the most of it's humorous, but I I've all, I also know that the Orville was shooting for humor, and I, even though I didn't get very far into it yet, I, I can see where it's I can see things that have potential to become good. And I've seen clips from future episodes where they actually do tackle real issues, and because as I understand it, uh, Seth uh, McFarlane, Seth McFarlane, he wanted to be funny, but also wanted to basically be Star Trek. To have a message, I think he. I think he was a big Star Trek fan. Yeah, that's why he did it. I think he actually wanted to be on Star Trek. Yeah, and I, I've heard that the show is probably on indefinite hiatus because one of the actors basically said that they they're not even sure like the show is still being produced or not. Because I guess the I guess the problem is that Seth MacFarlane also wants to write all the scripts, and that's just taken a while. And so who knows what's still going or not? Which is a shame because, like I said, I watched the first few episodes of it. It looked good, and I do plan on going back. So. What else? What other? Any other topics that we've got? Uh, all over the place. But. No, I don't think we got anything else from movies. Uh, books, just briefly, like I mentioned, I did finally finish the Battletech book I was reading. Uh, it's Elements of Treason, Duty. There's two other Elements of Treason books. Uh, this one dealt with the foundation of the Tamar Pact and the Ill Clan era. Those of you who all Battletech, you know what that means. For the rest of you, that's total gibberish, and I'm not going to spend a half hour explaining it. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I'd have to explain like 4,000 years or no, 400 years of, uh, no, 1,100 years of fake history into the future to, to get there. So we're not going to do that. Uh, but I'm going to try to order some more Battletech books. I'm in the middle of reading an actual book called Strong Towns, uh, basically explaining that we really screwed up with the suburb concept. And uh, we should have stuck with how we normally built cities, which was slowly go up and out at the same time, instead of just like flat landing it and just going out, 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 out. So uh, there's mainly tax reasons that you don't want to do things like that. And we're going to find out in the near future that we really screwed up, probably. So we'll, we'll see. 
Well, you know, RoboCop had the right way of handling that. Well, it's funny you should mention that, because after this guy explains, like, the problem, and explains, like, all the components to it, he's like, so, you want to know the first city in the U.S. that began engaging in all this, like, about 20 years before all the others? Detroit. Detroit. He's like, you know what city has basically fallen apart and about 20 years behind all the others? Detroit. So, yeah. Oh, I know. There was one thing I was going to make a comment about um, Star Trek. So, where um, was it Deep Space Nine got probably the most accurate representation of the future when they showed to San Francisco and... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I even vaguely recall that episode. They go back in time and like, oh, this is San Francisco, like 2023 and yeah. like... You see the picture that you see actual San Francisco 2023. It's like, and, yeah. And this yeah. is, and this is not, and again, this is not being mean, anything like that, but they show like a, a tent city. Yeah. In San Francisco. Talked about like sanctuary zones and all kinds of stuff like that. It's it like, is, it is scary. It's, it's uncanny. Yes. It is scarily. It's like somebody actually went to the future. It's like, I got you. I'm going to put this in there. You know, it's like, so yeah. now I'm just waiting for World War Three and the eugenics wars for Khan to conquer a third of the Earth and then leave. Or actually, I think it was the eugenics wars first, and then the tail end of that is the nuclear World War Three, right? I think is the timeline. And then we meet the Vulcans and take off. But did the SS Botany Bay not have hyper or have a warp drive on it? I don't know. It it couldn't have because it would have been before Cochrane. Yeah. So. It was probably just a, just a rocket with them in suspended animation. So, and it's like three hundred years in the future when they find them. So, yes, and the one bit of uh, continuity or when Chekhov, you know, when he recognizes che- the only thing I'm going to say is that Chekhov was a crew member that was like, yeah, that's that's what most people have gone with. Is that, that is that he was a crew member? He just wasn't like prime time bridge member yet. Yeah, so. And it would be fine that uh, Khan could remember him because he's got superior intellect. Yes, the superior intellect. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think I mentioned this last time, but apparently this thing I read from Ricardo Montalbán, he was asked about the chest, and he said, no, that's all him, so not a chest piece. Well, I still like the fact that they had uh, a del- or deleted scenes where there was actually a baby on the uh, USS Reliant when it got exploded. Yeah, because it, you know, he, it, it, well, I mean, even even without that, you saw that some of his crew, crew were clearly kids. I mean, because there's supposedly a shot of this kid um, on the transporter pad next to the Genesis device, and I mean, they they obviously took it out because they're like, no, people are going to be very distraught at the fact that uh, this kid obviously is dead. Um, but it does. I mean, probably, but you could also play it up as you know, Khan was that big of a monster just to bring kids with him into an, you know, to, to a fight. Well, like, he, I mean, he, when he, he could have, could have left him on the station. He could have just left. Like he, well, had, yeah, he could have just been like, you know, I could go find Kirk and kill him. Or as his second in command is like, we have a starship. Like, let's just go like screw Kirk. Let's leave. We've got everything we want. And he's like, no, you know, cause well, you see, he's, yeah. he's Ahab and Kirk is the white whale. So yes. Oh, some of the best dialogue in any movie. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so yeah, uh, I don't think we have anything else in well, no comic books. I forgot. So, uh, so there's been some interesting hubbub in the comic book world. Uh, first, for those of you who happen to read the X Men and don't know, uh, the Krakoan era is coming to an end in the next few months. We'll see how that plays out. Who knows? Probably not written well, because the current writing is sketchy at best, but we'll see. Uh, After that, it's going to be taken over by more people with sketchy backgrounds who can't really write too well. So, you know, God help us. Then, uh, uh, let's see. There was a comic shop owner in New Jersey who basically just went on a big tirade about, like, what's wrong with the comic industry and why things are failing. And... And pretty much as I expect, as I expected, a number of comic book personas, writers, artists, etc., attacked him instead of you know addressing the fact he's he's correct. Uh, however, it all kind of blew up pretty spectacularly in their face from the looks of things. Uh, they uh, did not get the backup they thought they were going to get, and they never really addressed any of the things he said. It basically just made fun of him. So yeah, yeah well, I mean, and that's the problem is that. 
that seems like, again, I'm not going political, but arguments in general that one is a lot of arguments are based off emotion. And two is when somebody comes in and says something that you, that the other, other group, and this, I guess this can be right. It can be left. It can be whatever. It can be everything. When somebody comes in with a fact or a statement or something that they can't, you know, go back and debunk, can't go back and say anything. The next step is to personally attack them. Right. It's the if you can't if you can't attack the message, you attack the messenger. So. And, and and don't get me and like I said, it 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 it's it's bad because I mean, one of the great things in back you know, like when we were growing up is that you could actually debate people. You could actually talk. You could talk your points. And you know, it was fine if you didn't see eye to eye. You you would say your points. You say. I think the problem is, is that now every voice has a platform. Yeah, well, and I know that's I know that's bad because everybody should have a platform to be able to speak their mind. But yes, like a tube for you, for instance. Yes, I wouldn't know what a YouTube platform would be. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm just speaking to this thing here. I don't know that I'm speaking to anybody. But yeah. Uh... This has happened a couple of times. There's been other people that have called out. There have even been some insiders that have called things out in the comic industry. And there's just this circle of creators who are not good at their job, who all they do is attack. And it, it's, 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 they're the reasons that the industry is going to collapse because there's no, like, the sales of manga prove that there's a market for comic books. It's just that Western books. Well, for, the main reason is they cost too much, but the second reason is you buy like a book from Marvel, depending on the book you buy, the whole issue might be people eating at a diner. Like, I don't buy X-Men comics for that. I buy X-Men comics to see people with mutant powers whooping ass. You know, I want, you know, I want character behind it. I want like Claremont level writing, but Claremont also put a, a ton of action in things and Claremont laid plans for six years down the road, seven years down the road. I mean, the man, helped in the band had like a 15 year run on the book, but like, well, he understood the craft. Did you see the latest news on Alan Scott? Which part? His retcon. Which retcon? That he's now going to be transgendered. No, I didn't see that. I, I knew that like for quite a while, his character has been written as a gay man. Yes, now he's going to be trans. Again, nothing wrong with that. And then people are like, you know, the big complaint is like, why does it have to be an established character? Why can't we write new characters or new... Right, which, uh, in case, I, I know I meant, I'm like 90% certain I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but the argument has always been, well, new characters just don't ever become as popular. It takes a lot of effort. Well, that's true, but there is a counter example that I never even, well, two in the comics. There's miles Morales. Miles has been popular just about since the debut. He's a non-white character. Like at the moment, the only thing holding miles Morales back is the fact that there are two Spider-Men. Miles Morales needs a new persona, a new superhero persona, you know, to, to differentiate him from Peter Parker since they're both in the 616 universe now. They do that, Miles Morales will take off even more so. That's the only thing holding him back. Yeah. But in the movies, we have Coulson. Coulson is not a comic-created character. He was created for the Iron Man movies. Yep. And then became popular enough, they gave the man his own TV show. How many seasons did Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? It's like six? Yeah, well, he also had his... The, the, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had their own comic book, too. Yeah, he's since become a comic book character now. So that proves that you can do it. And so, and you've got Kamala Khan. You know, now she's, like, sales-wise, she's a little less popular than Miles, but everyone seems to like her as a character. Yeah. So, and she's she's very likable in the live action, too. By the way, I love, I love the actress that plays her for a few things she's said recently, by the way. Uh, yeah, she said some stuff like, well, one thing like about her movie, she's like, well, it's not my responsibility if the movie tanks. Right. <laughs> and uh, she's like, I did my part, you know. Well, and the, and the uh, no, not, not that the, the Avengers video game was very good, but the main character you play as in the Avengers video game is Kamala Khan. Yeah. 
which is kind of nice because obviously just putting you in like Thor, the, you know, oh, I'm going to be Thor, I'm going to be Iron Man. It's like, okay, but, you know, why not put yourself in a character you can actually build up and level up that yeah. isn't already at the top of their game? Yeah. But, uh, no, I wish I could remember what else she said. Uh, but basically it just showed, like, she she's above all the petty crap. You know, she's not going into this, oh, this is a movie for women and all this baloney. Like, she's like, she comes across as, one, she's an actual fan of the character and was so before she got the job. Yeah. And, two, like, she's just there to do the job. She's not going to wade into the culture crap. So, you know, good on her. But, uh... Now, so, we also have a uh, retcon in the X-Men here, like, 40 years in the making. Well, and see, and, okay, so before you get on the retcon, not all retcons are bad. Sometimes retcons are good. Um, you know, such as changing Lex Luthor's original um, reason he hated Superman because Superman made him bald. Yeah, I don't know if that's why he hated him. Well, but I mean that that was at one point he got you made me bold. Yeah, well, you know, like that would be oh, okay. I I could see him retconning that. And again, and there's nothing wrong, wrong with retconning a character to be you know, like Alan Scott. Like I didn't know anything about him. I don't know if he if his wife was a or a woman or girlfriend or anything was anything of importance. If it wasn't, him being well, gay. To the best of my knowledge, he has a daughter. So uh, Jade, I believe. Oh. Could be wrong on that, as far as which, as far as whose daughter is, but I believe it's Jade. So, oh, yeah, then he could have been bisexual, and that would have been fine. Yeah, that's yes the the forgotten sexuality, but because uh, you, I'm sure you've noticed, like it's usually either straight or gay. Like, there's very few bisexual characters, or they're or they're bisexual in name only. It's yeah. oh, they're bisexual, but we're just going to have them in same sex relationships. Yeah, and it's like, well, then you may as well just say they're gay. Like, just just don't beat around the bush. Just just say that, and you know, because if you're going to make them bisexual, then you know, I want to see them actually being interested in both genders. You know. Yeah. Well, and I think um, like one of the few that I can think of that they always have kept that way has been Mystique. It's funny you should mention Mystique, Jim. Well, I did see the uh, the retcon, <laughs> and if you're talking about the retcon where I am about where, Nightcrawler, where Mystique. It, in her and Destiny, yes. and she she transformed into a man. That, that is the one. That is the one. And a lot of people are like, yeah, like, <coughs> so Azazel is now not. Which okay, so I'm, I I need to I need to I need to mention beforehand that I have not read the issue yet. I, I will read it. It's on my pull list, but uh, maybe like a year from now, once I get through all my back issues, but. They, uh, okay, so his initial origin from way back in the day was that Mystique was his mother and some German baron was his father. Then in, I want to say, late 90s, early 2000s, I think it's the Chuck Austin run. Everyone hates the Chuck Austin run, apparently, by the way. Uh, that's where he, uh, <coughs> where it became Azazel was his dad. And now they're going with, Mystique shapeshifted into a man, which apparently means that she can also alter her genetics, which <coughs> that's the more serious retcon, in my opinion, and that Destiny was his mother. But because of her recently having been posing as a Zazel or something, like, there's still some bits of him in the origin here, too. I think. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't read it. But now... I'm not as sore about it as some people because I've read for decades that that was Claremont's original intention was that it was supposed to be Mystique and Destiny with Mystique shapeshifted as a man. And just the people at Marvel at the time were like, you can't do that. Sorry, Chris. Like, the the customer base will only accept so much. It's an open secret that Claremont, that was his intention. So my issue with it is after a certain point... And you've already introduced other origins, like maybe let's not, sorry, Kitty, maybe let's not go back and retcon things. You know, they've existed this long. What are we adding to the story? Because now the way it looks is, okay, so Destiny's his mom, right? So now both Destiny and Mystique abandon him. Because, like, 
that's still his origin. He was still abandoned by them. And this is ultimately some kind of trial run for whenever they eventually adopted Rogue later on. Like, there's now there's two really shitty parents instead of one, one of whom can see the future. And, like, would know that this would cause would screw with Kurt. Like, this makes things worse. And it makes Mystique even more of a monster. Mystique is an absolute monster, by the way, in the comics. For those of you who don't know, she's she's not the, oh, I'll occasionally kill people to get my way, Jennifer Lawrence. She No, she is an absolute monster. Well, like, the, the one thing I never understood in any of the runs with her in the movies is, why does she not have an outfit on? And that's all Brian Singer and his, and his weirdness. Like, I, I know that we're never going to go with a comic outfit, as cool as it would be with the white dress and the skull belt, but, like, she should have had something on. You know? That, that's Brian Singer and his weirdness. Don't ask me. Yeah. But, yeah. So, that's, yeah, that, that is the big retcon. So, I don't mind the retcon itself, because that was Claremont's original intention. Okay, fine. Uh... You know, I do mind that that potentially screws with Mystique's powers. Because up till now, she's only been a shapeshifter. If she can adapt genetic, if she can alter her genetics, to what extent does it stop at male and female? Or can she, like, just randomly grow new organs? Like, if she gets shot in the pancreas, can she just, like, grow a new one? Well, and Can that... she adapt, like, Darwin's genetics and basically be unstoppable? Well, and see, that's the problem that I had with the Days of the Future Past movie, where they were, like, so reliant. Like, it's fine if they were using her shape-shifting abilities to make the Sentinels, like, blend in with people. Yeah, well, that, uh, again, that was, even though I still think that's the best of the X-Men movies, um, that was the one part that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, she, her ability isn't to mutate. Her ability is to change form. Darwin would have been the more suitable. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to base it on any of the ones that we'd seen up to that point, Darwin would be the one to base them on. Well, there's still some talk that Darwin didn't actually die from what happened to oh, him. You mean the guy whose one and only power is to not die just kind of got killed? Yeah, speaking of which, I saw a, a little video that was talking about Mr. Immortal and his ability that, that he literally can't die and he will he'll keep being resurrected till the end of time. And even yeah. after the end of time, he'll still be the only one left. That it was uh, Death Urge. Uh, his I granted his mom some sort of request, and that he would look over him and make sure nothing ever happened to him, and he just started like uh, being just like death prone. Yeah. So the only thing he could do was pretty much make him immortal, and in doing so, pretty much gave him <laughs> never the ability. He will never die, so he will be the only one left at the end of time, and he's the only one that's truly immortal. Well, I mean, Apocalypse is damn near close to it. Like, as near as I can tell, his one of his abilities, his soul cannot be destroyed. So, because Cable literally hit him with a weapon designed to destroy someone's soul at one point, and he came back from that. As one does. He, uh, he intentionally killed himself in one of his battles with the X-Men, thinking, because he owes the Celestials a debt that he doesn't want to repay if he can at all help it. What's that? What well, it? it doesn't say what it is, but it's they, they knew he found one of their ships and was tinkering with it. And so in exchange for him, them allowing him to continue and to merge with the celestial technology into his form, uh, and he became their guy who's supposed to like make sure that humanity reaches some certain point, in exchange for that, he owes them something to be determined down the road. And so, in one of his battles with the X-Men, he uh, jumps into, like, a fusion reactor to destroy himself, and he's sitting there in the void, you know, basically thinking to himself, well, is this it? Is this actual final death this time? And he's, you know, relieved that he's not going to deal with Celestials, and his heart starts again. He's like, oh, shit. So, yeah, it's it's to be determined on that one, but, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was the big thing, is the thing with Nightcrawler. And, like I said, I... I don't care about the retcon itself, you know, as far as that. It's just that I think we're like 40 years too late for it. Yeah. You know, it should have been something that during Claremont's era, Mystique should have dropped that bomb on Kurt. You know, that, yeah, this, from what I've, from what I've heard, this makes Mystique and Destiny just like 
monumentally terrible. Xavier too, apparently, because I guess he was mind wiping people to make them not know, and which is par for the course with Xavier at this point. But yeah, he's a terrible person. Kind of is. Kind of is. Good dream, but man, willing to make a lot of compromise to make it happen. You know, you, you go people like well, Magneto's. He he's up front about all of his intentions. Yeah, I mean, I don't like Magneto, but like, I get it. I get where he's coming from. He's very upfront about it. You know, he is homo superior. Yeah, and and, and you know, and he's not above making friends with regular humans too. Like, there's a few regular people he's made friends with that like he sincerely hopes that like nothing's ever going to happen to them. You know? I and, did uh, not know. Yeah, there's a, there's a few people in a few issues. And, uh, you know, he, I, I think deep down, he does actually want things to work. I think he wants Charles' dream to work. It's just that he's seen the other side of people up close, and he knows that it's probably not. So. Now, the problem is if they keep rewriting the X-Men, at some point, Magneto's going to be too far removed from the, the Holocaust to. Uh, I, from, I think Magneto's the easy one. Because with him, just say that part of his powers is that the Earth rejuvenates him, keeps him the magnetic field keeps him younger. Oh, yeah. you know, just go with that. You know, just keep it that he meets Charles. You know, somewhere down the road. You know? My question: Did Magneto ever, as a child, meet Captain America? I doubt it. Uh, I mean, it's possible because they do kind of every chance they get, they'll go back to World War Two. Like Wolverine is in World War Two, Captain America's in World War Two, Dracula's in World War Two. Uh, Oh. Yeah, I know. Um, Aaron Blood, he uh, in World War One served Dracula as his emissary to the Germans. In World War Two, worked for the Nazis. So great, uh, great reference list. Dracula and Hitler. So <laughs> yeah, Captain America killed him during World War Two. Though he's one of the only people that's actually killed. He cat up into the shield and decapitated him with it. But if you ever look at drawings of Captain America where it looks like he's got like scales in the costume. That's why, because there's chain mail underneath it, because he knows vampires are a real thing in Marvel. So he's protected, just in case. Uh, but yeah, also, Mr. Sinister, apparently, I guess somewhere along the lines, they were like, yeah, he kind of threw in with the Nazis, too. Because it's like, you know... Well, the genetic side of things. Yeah, that, that's sense. why. Is Mr. But, Sinister... But also, I, making him just the absolute monster that he really is. I know, but I mean, Mr. Sinister would take any chance he got to openly do genetic testing or manipulation or whatever, whoever would offer it. Yeah. So. Yeah, he's uh, he's got ties to a bunch of characters' pasts. Um, he uh, He's the reason that Sebastian Shaw has his powers. Not directly. Sebastian Shaw's dad, he did something to him to give him powers, and so then his son is born as a mutant. So, like, the, the inc- was it the Incredible Hulk uh, thing where, how Bruce Banner is supposed, or not, he didn't even go by Bruce Banner, didn't he? He was in the uh, Eric Bana Hulk movie, because his dad had d- did manipulation on himself, and that's supposedly what transferred the... Yeah, it's something like that. Um, his, no, he, he went by Bruce, it's in the TV series. The okay, old TV series okay. where he was, uh, um, I don't remember what his name was, but it wasn't Bruce. It was David, I think, or something like that. Yeah, something like that. And oh, for, oh. for no apparent reason either. you know. Just Oh, that's right, because in the movie, he didn't go by Banner. He he went by Bruce, but he went by his adopted last name. And then it's like, it's Banner. Yeah. And then I'm going to turn a giant absorbing electrical person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give Ang Lee credit for like making that look like a comic book. You know, yeah. like that was a different approach, you know. And I, I like how it's it's not really in continuity, but it does also explain how what's his name is in South America at the beginning of his movie. So maybe it is. Who knows? I don't know. The movie was something. Yeah. I, I think it had some good moments in it. I mean, just the Hulk hulking out onto, you know, the random military people. Yeah. I think the the filming was pretty good. Uh, who was the actor that played uh, Ross? Ross, that was uh, Sam Neill. Yes, before he was Ghost Rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam Neill with that magnificent mustache. He has, I think, everything I've ever seen him in. Actually, probably one of the better portrayals of Ross. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We get to see Harrison Ford try that. Try it next. 
maybe, if that movie ever comes out. I mean, I'm sure it will, but, you know, it's been delayed again. Reshoots, the whole thing. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was the big thing in, in the comic news this week. Um, that's, that's definitely making the rounds on, on the Facebook groups and uh, everywhere else. So, yeah. Uh, I don't really have anything else in your books. Uh, gaming news. Let's see. There was something. Oh. Uh, a couple things. The game Apiary is finally out, uh, where we get to play as these sentient bees in the future that have spaceships. Haven't played it yet, but it is out now. So, look forward to that. Um, and as, as, as much as Bobby's not interested in it, the, uh, the trailer for GTA 6 came out, which, oddly enough, doesn't come out, I think, until 2025. Seems very early for a trailer, but... Yeah. I give GTA, uh, Five credit because it has been going since the 360 PS3 era, um, and still going, still getting updates regularly for the online game mostly. Yeah. Um, but now they they took place. You know, the GTA Six looks like it's gonna be taking place back in Vice City again, which again was all right. So you can get it somewhere new again. Uh, but I liked how people are already expecting that. GTA 7 is going to take place in Europe because GTA 2 did, or one of the second. Because they're just recycling the same things over and over again. Uh, I don't know if that'll be a game that I'll play, but a lot of people are just like, eh, eh. you know, it's kind of the same thing. And I guess a lot of people are bummed because they're not giving Red Dead. Uh, it's, it's, you know, whatever. And I think maybe it's time for a new open world game of some sort in, in the GTA likeness, but you know, something else, maybe medieval. Yeah, maybe. I don't know how you'd make that work. People will be like, Oh, it's lost souls. No, no, make it like red dead redemption, make it like GTA, but make it set back in medieval times. Maybe, maybe uh, maybe you can make it during the Spanish inquisition. Yeah. He's got to make you sure. Probably shouldn't. Tom does mostly a joke. I said, you just have to make it in such a way that it's not like Assassin's Creed or Thor Ra- or um, not Thor, uh, God of War, Ragnarok, or anything like that. Well, like it- I mean, if they're going for like rage bait, like some of the stuff in the Grand Theft Auto game seems to, make it during the Crusades. It doesn't really matter which side you're playing on; you'll piss somebody off on that one. So, just. I mean, I don't get into much of the gaming news. It's just funny to finally see it because obviously somebody had leaked footage of GTA 6 a while back. Somebody had hacked, you know, hacked Rockstar and got some of that. And um, I don't know, there's a big whatever about it. So they finally had to release something because people knew it was out there. As your own company, if if other people are leaking your crap at some point, you just need to get a trailer together and yeah, yeah. get ahead of it. So that way people aren't hacking your crap anymore, or at least not as much. So, Yeah, well, I would just like to see more Mega Man X games, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Well, I am glad to see it, there being a resurgence in side-scrolling, retro-looking games, because I think we had gotten so far into realism in games that, you know, just... And this is a conversation I had uh, with... Um, with my significant other and different things that back when we used to play video games, like you'd sit down for an hour or two and play a video game. But then after that, we would go outside because it's like there was, it was good. It was entertaining, but it wasn't something you just felt like you wanted to drone out all day, every day. You would play for a little bit and you go outside. Now, I mean, the way that games are now, they, they make, I mean, pretty much they make like going outside on the video game. So, I mean, <laughs> GTA is a perfect example. I mean, you can pretty much explore the city, go to, you know, do this, do that, drive around town, go to the beach, go to wherever, go to the military base. Uh, reminds me of this meme picture I saw. And I wish I could remember what it actually said, but it's it's got a kid sitting in a window seal looking outside, the window's open. But he's got on headphones and a keyboard, and like, but that's his monitor is, you know, yeah. the real world. You know, something like the real world, the greatest RPG of all, or something like that, you know. And 
I mean, don't get me wrong, those games still have a place and they're fun to, you know, to dig into for a little bit, but there's something about just having a game where you can just play into a small little and, you know, get to, uh, once you get that out of the way, you go outside, you go and do other things, so. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so, I, that's why I said I am glad to see a resurgence of games that, you know, while they may still take 8, 10, 12 hours to beat, they're much more meant to be taken in chunks. They're not meant to be. So what you're saying is you don't want it to be like Crusader Kings 2, where at the thousand hour mark, you're still a noob. Because you probably still don't understand what all the controls do yet. Yeah. Well, and that's like. Uh, and you haven't fought anyone for Jesus' foreskin yet. <laughs> that's an actual thing that can happen in that game, by the way. People are not making that up. It's a holy relic you can attempt to obtain. You can overthrow the Pope. You can go and fight in the Crusades, as the name suggests. Uh, you can, like, imprison your brother, your significant other, anyone that you think is going to make a move on the throne, imprison them or execute them. Go float a, a, an obviously false claim on someone else's throne to give you your Cassius Belli to go and attack. I read one guy, his whole approach is he picks Ireland and marries, like, the 16th person in line for the English throne. And then slowly starts killing the people above them until he's the, finally on the English throne. And then builds up the army to go and invade France and then finally fight his way into the Holy Land to fight the the uh, the Islamic hordes there. And so, yeah, I'm assuming under Saladin. But, uh, yeah. And here yeah, I'm... <laughs> and apparently one of the expansions you can, like, sell people into slavery to be shipped off to Asia or something. Like... This game is just, there's a whole forum dedicated to, it's, it's literally, I think it's literally called, like, shit that happens in Crusader Kings 2. So, yeah. Like, in the tutorial, it was like, you need to kill your brother, like, your wife's acting up, imprison her, take out this noble, hey, there's this chunk of North Africa, we can gussy up a claim for you to have, and you need to go invade. I'm like, not from North Africa. It's like, do it anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a... I've been playing it for hours. I'm still in the tutorial. Where the heck? Man. And I'm thinking here, like, playing, like, back playing Super Metroid, where it, you could, even on even as a novice, could beat it under eight hours pretty easily. Not get 100% of the items. Now, but, I mean, those are the things that you'd, you'd play in a bite-sized chunk. You'd go out and you'd do other things. I, I see Owen on uh, playing Rainbow Six Siege online just doing the same thing over and over again. He'll he'll play, you know, best you know best out of five or whatever, and over and over and over again. It's you know just sometimes he does good, sometimes he does bad. There's no story, there's no nothing. It's just monotonous. Well, I know uh, I know Resident Evil Three is on the shorter end of the Resident Evil games, but at, since I've played the secondary game so much and built up so much money and I've got infinite ammo for all the weapons plus all the weapons with those I can burn through the game in an hour and a half like just running through just blazing away at everything when a, a nemesis comes you just rock just a rocket launcher to the face and keep going you know anything else you just keep the M16 handy so you can just or if there's a whole lot of enemies you bust out the Gatlin and just mow down everything in the street in front of you you know I set yes. the grenade launcher, take them out. I mean, yeah, you you just you just go, you know, you just you don't stop for anything. Well, the one thing I did like about the first Resident Evil game was that the rocket launcher did not have splash damage, so you could like launch it right next to you, and and having infinite ammo on the rocket launcher in the first Resident Evil game, yeah, like nothing was like yeah. Uh, because that's like one shot's the tyrant at the yeah, end. Yeah, the, whenever you've got the weapon to take out the final boss in the beginning of the game, <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, you know, because uh, I still remember that first zombie when he turns around and looks at you. That was the creepiest thing. And then with the rocket launcher, you're just like, hmm, what was that? Oh, I don't worry. I just carry my rocket launcher with me. Yeah. <laughs> Using it indoors. Yeah, what's well, uh, me and my cousin, our nephew, Brandon, we were playing Resident Evil 6. And it's two players. And uh, he's not playing the other game, so he just, like, burns through all his handgun ammo. And he's like, all right, I need more ammo. I was like, well, good luck. I was like, you've never played the other games, have you? Like, ammo's actually kind of sparse in these games sometimes. 
Meanwhile, he's like he's. That's when he finally figured out why I was going hand to hand against the zombies everywhere I could using my judo moves, because you can in that one. And uh, he's like, "Why are you fighting him hand to hand?" He's like, "I might need these bullets someplace else." That's why. Is that the one he punches a, or Chris punches the boulder? Or is that I think that's five. Yes. Yeah. Because he, yeah, he goes hand to hand with a boulder. Yes, and wins. <laughs> Probably the stupidest moment in you know what in a game that's supposed to have some sort of realism. Yeah. I mean, obviously the zombie, you know, the zombie. We'll say there is a virus out there. I think a, a normal dude, a normal Jack dude, punching a boulder is. Yeah, well, I mean, at that point, you're fighting Wesker, who basically has superpowers. So, one you the, know, one of the few things they actually brought into the uh, the movies. Yeah. Yeah. I still don't understand how they actually killed him in the final one. Like, he should have had all his powers intact. They, like, crushed him with a door or something, right? Well. Like, did, literally, like, the door to a room. Well, did not, he, not, like, a castle door or something. Did he survive being blown up on that plane? Yeah. Yeah, because you see him towards the, yeah, at the end, he's on the plane that gets blown up. I think you actually can see him parachuting from the guy that's in the sewer tunnel. Like I think if you you see yeah. the yeah, I think you can see him bailing out, but he's in the final movie. Because it has to still have his powers. Because there's a stupid part because he he takes away Alice's powers and then immediately in the next movie gives them back to her. Yeah, and they're probably like, well, that was a dumb thing for us to do. Well, the biggest problem those movies have, aside from not sticking to the games, is that like in between each movie they change where the plot's going. So they have to like either retcon the last movie or like just hope you don't ask too many questions about why things are different now at the very beginning of this movie. You're saying what the Star Wars sequels should have looked at and said, hey, look how it failed here. We probably should have a, a consistent plot in what we're doing. Yeah, something like that. And not have Ryan Johnson direct a movie. Yeah, well, here they had Wes, or Paul Anderson. You know. So Mila Jovovich's husband. You know, director of Mortal Kombat, the first one. Yeah, the good one. And uh, Event Horizon, to his credit, you know, that's how I know he can actually make a decent movie. Because Event Horizon wasn't based on another property and is, you know, pretty damn freaky. So, I don't know, I guess apparently you just need to put him on actual horror movies that are original. So, Now, if we ever get an original horror movie again, or original anything. Uh, I mean, we still get some things. Like, we talked about that one movie that we didn't watch yet. The one that had, like, the... $80 million budget, maybe. Oh, yeah. That looked fantastic, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know, that's probably about all I got for gaming, Jim. Oh, no, sorry. We should actually just make a whole separate section for this, but I was at Ollie's the other day. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I think I mentioned it before, but Ollie's is like a, what is it? Retail arbitrage, I think is the term. They buy stuff from, like, Target and whoever that just can't sell, like big lots. And I got the uh, latest, uh, the Dragonlance board game that came out towards the beginning of the year when they made the big push for all the Dragonlance stuff. This board game retails for 100 bucks. What do you think I paid for it? Retails for 100 Yeah. 20 You're close. You're still over. Ten dollars. Ten bucks. But these other things that have tiles for like dungeon stuff, normally fifty, three dollars. Where's there an Ollie's around here? Bedford, in Vincent's, in Evansville, Indianapolis. But yeah, I almost bought some more of those, but the guy actually had to go get the box out of the back, and I was like, I don't want to buy all these. I'm not one of those guys. So, yeah. So yeah, hell of a find. I just got to put them to use or resell them. One of the two, but probably better use. Well, well you, I actually wanted to see the, the board games. So. You mean the, uh, well, when you say that you're not one of those, it makes me think of where when the NES Mini came out and people bought them all up and, <coughs> and then turned and flipped and sold them all. Oh, well, I flipped one. Uh, and and that's and that's fine, but like when people would go in and buy entire stocks for people not to buy any. Yeah, well, I know, I, I know. At one of our closer WalMarts, they tried to make sure that didn't happen with the Super Nintendo Mini because it came out at midnight, oh. and uh, they made people get into a line. It was one per, but then like after the first ten people, like no one else showed up, 
So they just got back in line and just kind of kept circling. So. Oh, but the Super Nintendo Mini, I don't know what Nintendo did to, is that they made, what they did is they, they, they accepted the demand and kept releasing more and more. Yeah. So the scalpers ended up getting hung up with extra inventory yeah. because Nintendo kept making more consoles. They're like, well, if somebody's buying them. Yeah, which they, is what they should do, but. And then, which was funny because it really screwed over a bunch of scalpers. Well, not me, but no, no. Like I said, it's <laughs> it's one thing if you bought two and yeah, sold cause, one because me and Chad each got one, and we we went together and bought a third one, and we sold that one immediately, and we profited off that, but we didn't buy any others. And I think I think that would be fine. Like say, if I bought two things, and and and, and folks, just like I mentioned earlier, when we bought it, there were still several of them in the store. So I'm just talking about these people that would go to every store. How many store. Do you have? Ten. I'll take them all. And, yeah, and then every store, because like I said, I'm all for it. Like, say if if I have something, like a lot of times I'll buy like a lot. Like they'll have like, like at a yard sale or wherever I go, and they're like, it's a ga- a console and games. I already have the consoles. Then I flip and sell the console, and I I make the money back that I just bought all the games for. And I'd say that'd be fine for the console too. Like you buy one, you buy one to sell, then you sell it, make the money back to pay for the console you just bought. Now you got a free console. Yeah. I just think, you know, when you're, I'm um, hopefully people are at least nice enough that if, if there is a limited quantity and there's people in line that you're not going to be like, boink. Yeah. Well, like I said, the sorry guy, kid crying behind me. Yeah. No, I got to make my, yeah, bang. the guy had to go in the back to get these and he only brought one box of each out. So I don't even know how many they had. So I wasn't going to be like, no, I'm going to buy them all. You know, I was like, no, no, I'm buying one game for myself. I'm buying two things of the tiles. Like maybe I should have bought more of the tiles cause they're $3, but you know, I've got to actually open one of them up and see what kind of quality I'm looking at here. See if I'm actually going to be able to use them. So, but anyway, six dollars. You know, if I lose out on six dollars, I will. Uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of that was the last bit of gaming. But uh, there's a bunch of other games there. Always like nothing, nothing fantastic, but things like cheap enough. I'm going to take a chance on them. Oh uh, yeah, well we've been thrifting a lot. Um, I've got a, a, a girlfriend's got a, a, I had to build a bookcase to put all of her knickknacks because she likes to buy like the little, she finds all these little animal things and she's like, oh, they look so sad alone up there on their own shelf. So I've got knickknacks now up in my room. Um, I mean, they're cute, but anything to please, you know, to please the, uh, please the girlfriend, I'll do that. But being out, I've been out looking for video games and stuff like that. And man, it's just been dead. Like trying to find anything to pick up you now. Like vin- anything vintage or not, it's uh, it's tough. Like I don't find cartridge games anymore. Um, I should just put this for tales of collecting, but I remember going up to the Good Lo- Goodwill outlets up in Indianapolis, and they had you know the bins out there, and somebody brought out a tote full of video games in the box, dumped them out, and I remember having to like mad get over there and start picking through them, and. Uh, I remember I got a couple because a, a woman picked them up, and I said, "Hey, just to let you know that is for the Sega Genesis 32X. You have to have the 32X adapter for those to work." Because I had, because um, I got a couple that way. And she, because she finally gave them to me, because she's like, "Well, I think he has a Sega Genesis." I was like, "Well, it's for the 32X." I was like, "It's an attachment," and I even showed a picture, and she gave me the rest. But the copy of the game that I had in my hand, and the ones I think she gave me a couple others, were. Uh, Mortal Kombat 2 for the 32X in the box. Yeah. That's not something I'm ever going to find again. Like now, everybody in there, you know, and this is part of the uh, artificial inflation of video games where people are like, oh, it's an in the box. It's in good shape. They grade it. And now it's a, like they try to sell a copy of the original Mario for a million because it's sealed in the, you know, and I'm like, well, that's uh, you've got that with comics right now. There's there's definitely a, uh, a second the secondary market's accelerating, or at least it has been. I don't know if it still is, but because you've got you know every time they announce some new Marvel project, it's like okay, who's in it? What's the first issue that character ever premiered in? Go buy that. That's why Iron Man. I want to say fifty four. It's fifty four, fifty five. I think it's fifty four. Is worth a small fortune. Because it's the first appearance of Thanos, it's the first appearance of Drax, Moon Dragon, and like two or three other characters. It's like the jackpot of first appearances. 
Speaking of Drex, I'm glad they didn't go with his actual origin in the movies. I think, or even trying to explain that. What? Killed by Thanos? Resurrected as the ultimate weapon to destroy him? That would have been spectacular. Wasn't he like an insurance salesman or something? Yes. Something yeah. Like that. He should have gone with his original appearance, too. Was yeah, that? The, the giant green and purple skin with the cape and the, again, the skull belt and everything. Like, yes. I should have gone old school with all those characters. Uh, but. Gamora should have had her comic book outfit. Or, or lack of an outfit for most of it, I should say. Now, the um, the problem with all of that, though, is that they're taking an, an artificially inflating a market that doesn't need to be inflated. Because, like, a lot of these games are not, like, like, say if you have a a sealed copy of Mario 64, again, people are selling it, they will. Finally, the prices are, seem to be coming down, but you're selling it for thirty or $40,000. One of the most popular games for the N- or like the launch title for the N64. Yeah, there's going to be somebody that has it in the package. I would say, and I would agree, that it probably should be a you know two or $3,000 game because it's sealed. And the fact that it was a packing title, the fact that it's not opened, is actually kind of a rarity. But the astronomical prices, you know, that would be the only exception. A box copy that's been opened? No, it should be worth almost nothing. You know, because it's, again, people... There are a lot of people that keep the boxes for their games. Well, Jim, uh, the market for these things is fickle. I went through all my Lego poly bag sets the other day. And uh, once I put up the ones that had some kind of value to them in my BrickLink store, at the moment, my inventory, if I get what I ask for it, is worth about $2,500. So, and like... Have poly bags? 2000 of it is. I've already sold about $150 worth of them. Well, and, that's like six poly bags. And I have not recataloged my games because uh, my. And this is another thing is that there may be a possibility at some point in the future that we may change the venue again and we may change it to over at my parents' house for a while because that's where all my games are at right now because right now I'm remodeling rooms in this house so I don't have a place to put all of those. But if. You know, if I have people moving in here at some point in the future, which is going to be happening, we may have to move stuff to another location just because trying to film with a house full of people yeah. may be tough to do unless I find a better dedicated room in the house to do so. Yeah. Um, now, where I was going with that is that my games are not here. They're over there. And I did that specifically because I wanted to have a place where I could have them out, but not here where, you know, they could get damaged or dirt, you know, like dust from the remodeling and stuff. Um, but last time I cataloged, it was almost 10 years ago. And at that time it was like $15,000. And I can tell you hundred percent more than likely, I'm probably over 20,000, probably closer to $30,000 in my video game collection. Yeah. Um, and it may even be more than that. Now, some of the games are coming back down because for a while there, uh, my copy of Klonoa for the PlayStation 1 was in the $500 range complete. It has now came back to a more reasonable $300, $400. Um, yeah. But, well, I was just going to mention that I've already had a, I've had a, had an inquiry from a guy asking if I can send them to either Russia or Kazakhstan. Uh, apparently, the answer to Russia is no. Apparently, we can't send anything to Russia at the moment. Tell me you can send it to the Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go there, but <laughs> figuratively or literally. Uh, like, didn't have an interest in going there before the war, just to be clear. But, uh, yeah, so apparently I can send it to Kazakhstan, though. So, we didn't hear back from him. I'm assuming that means he lives on the border somewhere, but... Well, that's like... Um... Because I've I've had all kinds of sales to Southeast Asia. I've sent things to China, Japan, Thailand, and Vietnam, I believe. Well, when I bought my um, my third Philips CDI, because my God, I, I'm just a glutton for punishment. I broke my first one trying to mod it to put a um, uh, a pin or a, a socket for the um, the battery because I was going to unsolder it and end up busting one of the leads on the board. I could probably get it fixed, but um, nobody will work on it with at least the one place that I found won't work on it without actual schematics. Yeah, and I'm like, well, that's stupid. But yeah. the um, 
The second one just was dead on arrival. And it said it was dead on arrival. I didn't pay as much for it. And the third one came from the Netherlands. And it turned out in the Netherlands, the Philips CDI had a longer lifespan. It was like the one I have, and I can't, I'd have to look at the year, is definitely after they stopped selling them in the U.S. Like considerably much afterwards. So, yeah. Well, I did have a gentleman years ago ask me if I could ship something to Russia, and this is why we still could. Uh, it was the, uh, it's the clone, not the clone gunship, but I think it's the LAAT, the thing that carries the walkers. Yes. I had two of those at one point because I got them on sale half off and uh, had a guy in Russia want to buy one. And the problem was it was going to cost more to ship it than it was going to cost him to buy it from me. And I was wanting over retail for it. Like it was going to be like a six or $700 transaction. Yeah, he's like, oh, no. Yeah, he decided not to, and I told him, like, you really should try finding something closer, you know. Whereas the, this Kazakhstan deal, if I can keep the box under a pound, I can ship it there for $16. The moment it goes over a pound, it jumps to, like, 40-something. So, but it's, it's just a poly bag of, of uh, Admiral Yalarin, which I used to have two of, and, like, I couldn't get rid of the first one. <laughs> this one, I'm asking 100 bucks for, because that's the going rate. I don't know. Same thing with TC-14. Also like $100 figure now. The Iron Patriot from Iron Man 3 poly bag is like a $75 set. I don't know. I just I was going through them all. Like I'm seeing these prices. I was like, well, it's time for a mass upload apparently. Well, and I guess I, I, guess I could see why though. Because I mean, once they're discontinued, I mean, the poly bags are the one of those things like people buy because it's like, oh, it's a four or $5 bag. Or for free if you buy certain things from the Lego site. Yeah. And and it's simple enough. It's like, oh, the kids want something. Oh, here's a $4 poly bag. Right. Open it up. Right. Which at some point I actually have bought a poly bag and a box set so we can show the difference in scale for what you get for like a $5 poly bag and a $10 box set. That is a future video that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and but they're both Minecraft, so we're comparing apples to apples. So the um, hell, I had a Ninjago one that was going for like thirty five because it was only available at Toys R Us. It's got two guys in it and like a trophy. That's it. That's the set. And don't get me wrong, I have kids, and I can tell you, we bought a lot of poly bags. And sometimes, like you know, when you're on a budget, you're like, okay, you I can get have, something. Here's a poly bag. I have three Walmart bags that I basically can't close full of poly bags. Good for you. That's that's why it's so many. Because like some of these, I've got like I've got like eight or ten. Hell, is the Ninja Turtles when I have twelve of them. Unfortunately, they're only worth about four dollars, so I I'm not, I can't list those. You have to wait another twenty years when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got got to wait till they're worth more money, or I'm just going to open them. But you know, uh, so yeah, that's you know, I it's like I uh, I had the well, hell, I sold Revan for three hundred dollars. Speaking of turtles, um, this is, should have been in the movie. So they, I guess there was a fairly recent animated turtles movie. Did you see that? Is that the one with Seth Rogen did. Yes. Did you see that the like one of the artists that designed some of the characters? April, she looks exactly like like she, April looks exactly like her. That's not at all surprising. I mean. Because the people are kind of like, well, you know, they. I mean, the same thing happened with Velma, in they, the HBO series for the, the Scooby Doo. They're like, oh, you know, they they made April look a lot different. No, she made her. They made April look exactly like the person drawing her. Which I mean, mind it, if I was making a character, I'd probably just be like, yeah, I'm gonna sneak in a character that looks like me, but probably well, not he, the main character. Yeah, no, that's that's actually a big problem in comics at the moment. Not so much looking like them, but they're like, oh, 60 years of continuity? Who cares? They act like me now, which is also why all they do is go to restaurants and eat in half these comics, because these people don't have any life experience. That's all they know. Guys like Jack Kirby and some of these other guys, like, they fought in wars. Like, they went to other countries, you know? They lived lives. They had yeah. life experience. They could put that into their writing. These people only know how to go to Starbucks. No, um, like I said, the uh, well, the other one is when artists are like, I don't know how to draw people, so I'm just going to go and find some adult material and trace all the women to have faces and positions that are obviously not how people actually sit or act or whatever with their you know, adult magazine. 
Yeah, what's well, like this thing? I, the O faces. Yeah, it's like this thing I saw the other day. It used a picture from like The Simpsons, a Family Guy. Like, oh, cartoon creators only draw three fingers. Cause that's easy to do. They're like, here's the 1980s GI Joe cartoon. There's a full hand with all four fingers and a thumb. Here's another one in the same screen. Like, no, it's not hard. You're lazy. Like, well, the funny thing is, in The Simpsons, only God, I believe, had four fingers. Well, probably. <laughs> I think that was. No, it's because the art style they chose, four fingers will look unnatural because their fingers are too fat. You know, that, that's why. It has nothing to do with ease. Like, again, a kid's cartoon in the 1980s, drawn by probably underpaid Korean animators, like, looked just fine. Well, the Transformers had four fingers and a thumb on their hands. They're robots. Well, speaking of uh, animated... Also, more than meets the eye. Speaking of uh, animated stuff, uh, when we were in the... Um watching the Godzilla thing, they had a trailer for uh, Studio Ghibli. Ghibli? Ghibli? I don't know which one it is, so don't ask me. Uh, I, know, I know who you're talking about. I just don't know if it's Ghibli or Ghibli. So yeah, I think uh, it's Ghibli. But... I think it's Ghibli. Um, it is a uh, Boy in the Heron, I think is what it's called. And it's funny because it's like, oh, we've abandoned you know 2D animation for 3D, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you look at that, and it's like, this looks way better than most of the 3D animated movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you look at any of the Studio Ghibli stuff, like, it's, uh, it's you know, anything that Hayao Miyazaki has done. Like, I saw this one really funny uh, meme picture. I don't remember who the other artist was. The other artist, another Japanese artist, was like, oh, I love the Beatles. And you see his picture is like some whacked out, uh, like, Mind Flayer derived hellscape kind of thing. I mean, Miyazaki's always like, I fucking hate the Beatles. And you see this, this picturesque landscape that, like, you, you almost looks real. You're just like, hmm. I don't know what the Beatles did to piss off Hayao Miyazaki, but, <laughs> like, maybe he's on to something here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, like, I, I've got a couple of movies that he's done, and I've seen a couple others. Uh, like, I've got uh, Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind, and... Uh, I don't know much other movie I own, but like I've seen Princess Mononoke. That one's really good. Um, Chad tells me the others are really great. I haven't watched them yet. Uh, kind of like to see The Wind Also Rises. That one's a little controversial. It's about a guy who's a Japanese. It does. I don't think it has any fantastical elements like most of the rest. Uh, but it's a guy who's uh, obsessed with like aviation, so he becomes a plane designer. And I don't know if it gets into later on whenever he designs a particular plane that gained infamy, particularly this day, several decades ago. The Zero? Yes, he designed the Japanese Zero. But it's about it's about him before that point, I believe. So, But I've heard it's a really good movie. No, the, well, speaking of aircraft, uh, one of the aircraft in uh, Godzilla Minus One is a, um, is a tailless rear rotor aircraft hmm. should sound it, it may sound kind of familiar but the uh the, the real giveaway was they're talking about the aircraft and the guy was looking you know showing the, you know like the inside of the aircraft and on the back of the seat was german riding you know the one of the measure schmitz yeah i believe so yeah yeah or, or it was a it was, it was a german design that's all i know i wouldn't know what the aircraft would be called but um, it comes into play later. And if you've watched the movie, watch the review, we point that out in that. So, but Anyways, I think, I don't, I don't know. Actually, I think this, I think there's some clips you can get out of this. Yeah, well, we haven't gone to streaming yet. I actually have a little bit to talk about there. Streaming? Yeah. Well, I have not watched anything on streaming recently. Like I, say, I think last podcast I talked about some of the Christmas movies I watched. I have not watched anything I haven't had time to. Well, the only thing I've been watching is Lucifer. I'm in the final season now. So, um, the show's been decent. Ow. Oh, so Kitten the, attack. Yes. So, uh, the show, it's been decent. Um, it is melodramatic, okay? There is definitely a will-they-won't-they they kind of thing, which I knew from clips from YouTube that, yes, they will. Um... Spoiler alert. So, uh, you can tell where it jumps over to being a Netflix series, because it says a Netflix series. Also, it happened between season three and four. For some reason, season three has like 26 episodes, 
and like seasons four and five have like eighteen, and season six has like ten. So once I got past the midway point, things started to accelerate. Uh, it was interesting seeing Tom Welling in season three. He was Kane, as in the biblical Cain and Abel Cain. And not Superman. No, not Superman. Uh, he has been cursed to walk the earth forever for killing his brother. Sounds like a... And uh, so he comes to L.A. hoping that Lucifer will know some way to let him die, because he's lived for tens of thousands of years at this point. And they have a very funny conversation where Lucifer's like, have you tried like throwing yourself into a helicopter rotor blade? And he's like, yes, actually I have. He's like, what if you're split perfectly down the middle? Will there be two of you? And he's like, no, just one side will regrow. He's like, and he starts to go into this in-depth, like I call it the, uh, the monoparticle theory. And he's like, okay, fine, fine. Wolverine rules. I've got it. And, you know, Lucifer just cuts him off in the middle of it. Like he's clearly like thought this through quite a bit, you know? So, uh, initially he, he's going to try to come at him with a chainsaw. And at the end of the episode, he's like, so have you got anything? He's like, no, he's like, all right, get the chainsaw. So yeah, like he can die. He just doesn't stay dead. He regenerates. And, uh, so Lucifer, you know, keeps trying to figure out a way because he's been marked by God is, is the curse, you know? And, uh, but he does something that removes the mark. And, uh, so then he says he's going to kill himself, you know, Lucifer leaves and he shows back up the next day, uh, cause he's, cause he's the lieutenant there at the police department. And, uh, he's like, no, I've decided that I actually want to, you know, not die. Cause he wants to hook up with the detective that Lucifer wants. And, uh, yeah. So like Lucifer's brother talks to him is like, yeah, you know, mortality, like totally changes your perspective on things. Like, you know, you could die at any moment. Like we could be sitting here and you just drop over dead. Like some could hit you in the back, like, and then it's lights out. And he's sitting there listening to all this. And remember the man's lived for all of human history. Yeah. You know, cause he's Adam and Eve's son. And he's like, he's like, it suddenly finally really clicks with him. Like, Oh shit, I'm actually going to die now. Like maybe I don't want to die now. And so he's actually trying to find some way to get cursed again. You know, so you get another brother and kill him. Well, no, actually he, uh, pulls his brother out of hell and puts him into another body. And, uh, cause I can do that. And, uh, initially he does it like to try to like forgive him to get able to forgive him. And, you know, Abel's like, no, I'm not gonna forgive you. You're an asshole. He you killed me. Yeah, I'm kidding. Because Abel is the longest occupant in hell, you know, because he's the first guy to get killed. So, because uh, the way it works there is it's not so much about sin, it's about, like, guilt that you feel. So if you feel guilt over something, well, you're, you're not going up. And because um, one of the other main characters dies, and uh, they're quite surprised to find out he didn't go to heaven. And so Lucifer is actually trying to figure out how to get him out of hell. Because he's uh, very pissed off that those are the rules. So he's actively trying to become God to change the rules. Because God decides he's going to retire. And one of the angels got to take over for him. Bruce Almighty. Yeah. So they uh, basically have a big rumble between him and Michael, who looks just like him. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So there's, 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 there's some drama moments. There's some tearjerker moments. And now I'm in, like I said, I'm in the final season where... Here's a hero clicks connection. The guy that does the unboxing, Scott Porter, he's in the show now at this point. As this other cop that showed up. So, yeah. That's the only thing I've ever actually seen him in like live action other than unboxing the hero click stuff. Uh, I, I knew he was an actor, but I just had never seen anything he was in. No, so I made the comment about the Wish movie from Disney. One person had brought it very well. They said, if you want to see a movie where Granny and Everybody's Wish doesn't work out, Bruce Almighty. Yeah. Yeah. Because the world goes into chaos. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, because that's, that's what will happen. You know, because there'll be those people like, I wish you dropped dead. And, you know. Or Wishmaster. That'd be another one. Yes. Yes. Wishmaster. Uh, probably stop at part two. I wish my lawyer would go. That's in part two. <laughs> uh, part two, a little bit lower budget than part one. You can tell with the effects towards the end. Uh but part two still had the main guy as the wish as the gin. Uh, parts three and four have a different actor playing him, and he's not quite as good. 
Uh, and they start to introduce a bunch of other baloney in the mythology. So they're still not, they're not terrible horror movies, but the first one's the real gold. And uh, the first one's got a bunch of cameo appearances from other horror types. Like uh, the big guard at one point is Kane Hodder. The black guard outside of the, the fancy to do at the end is Tony Todd. The guy running the, the fancy art gallery is uh, the guy that plays Freddy Krueger, Robert England. Robert England. Uh, his assistant that gets killed at the very beginning of the movie is Ted Raimi. You know, it's just got all kinds of other like horror people in it. And it's a Wes Craven made the movie, you know. So the first one I thought was good. The second one's the second one's still okay. It's it's the uh what what's what I usually call this. It's the uh the Batman Forever of the franchise. It's okay, but you can tell things are not going in the right direction and a train wreck is imminent. The other two are basically Batman and Robin. No. Oh. Holy rusted metal, Batman. No, that's in Batman Forever. Is it? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Holy rusted iron rocks, Batman. What? The rocks. They're made of iron and they're full of holes because they're rusty. Oh. Greatest fan of the movie. Oh. In- invasive kitten. Yeah, well, you know. But yeah, that's uh, that's literally all I've been watching on streaming, so I'm trying to get through it. So, after that, well, did I... Jim, do you remember, did I mention... I think we did talk about the, the squid games, like... Yes. The... The, the, other, the live show, or yeah, the, the, the reality show. The other half of it's up, so I need to watch it. I think it's only like three episodes, just to see how it ends. Uh, but there's a couple other movies on Netflix that look interesting that I'm going to check out. Hopefully we'll be able to report on that next time. Uh, in like kind of just general streaming news, the Super Mario Brothers movie, the the new animated one, yeah, is on Netflix now. Oh. And so like a lot more people can see it than it just being on Peacock. Uh, and apparently, like it had a hell of an opening week on there too. So, speaking of that, uh, they've been really pushing Peacock. I've uh, been doing some Christmas shopping. I notice a lot of uh, things now will have like you you go to check out, and then it's like here's some offers for you. And Peacock's usually one of the many offers that I get. Yeah, yeah. I I gave serious thought to signing up for Hulu for a year, like two dollars a month. I almost did, but then I was like, but what's on there? And I wasn't sure what I was missing out. <coughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's all I've really got on streaming. Uh, yeah. We have anything in the miscellaneous topics to talk about? Uh, you know, I thought there was something, but I don't remember what it is now. Um, now like I said, I watched a, a random streaming thing talking about why us putting people on Mars is really isn't worth it. That's what it was. I tell you what, Jim, you can cover for about two minutes. I'll be right back. All right. Well, kind of, and I I've t- I talked to Bobby about this a little bit right before we uh, started, but the kind of the, the basic idea of it is that um, with all the talk about, you know, setting up a colony on Mars, you know, I watched, and again, I don't know the legitimacy of the claims, but the the idea is that us actually going to Mars is not a good idea. The fact that, um, well, one, just getting there, uh, two, what are we going to get while we're there? I mean, yeah, you're going to be able to, you know, research the history of the planet, look at that. But, like, say, are you going to go there for mining materials? Well, according to, you know, this one video I watched, there isn't a heck of a lot of stuff there to mine, that the composition of Mars is really not impressive at all. And if you were wanting to find stuff to mine, the better place to go would be, like, the asteroid belt or go to... You know, the moon, even the moon has more supposedly to offer because of it being very similar in composition to the Earth. The moon makes more sense than going to Mars. Now, I think going to Mars makes sense in a, you know, if you're going to have, you know, like a stopping off point. But because of the gravity of Mars, you know, having to take off from the planet's surface, you're still running into the, you know, you're still going to need, you know, more fuel to get off the surface versus, like, say, on the moon or even one of the moons of Mars would probably be a better option because of the lighter gravity and being able to take off. Uh, now, obviously, one of the advantages of using Mars versus any other planet is the fact that it does have a a uh, 
has more gravity. So for people living long term on a planet, not Earth, uh, it would be less detrimental to the body having the increased gravity, but the, still the gravity would not be enough to maintain proper muscle mass without some sort of assistance. Uh, very similarly to how, like on the International Space Station, they have to have a treadmill on there and they have to strap themselves down to the treadmill and pull themselves down onto the treadmill so that they can simulate, you know, the gravity of Earth while they're using the treadmill so they can keep their muscles built up and prevent them from atrophying and dwindling down to nothing. Um, even with Mars slightly increased gravity, you'd still have to do something to supplement that. Uh, but I'll let Bobby get back here. We're going to go grab a drink. All right. Um, now just one of the things I was kind of going on about, uh, with the whole Mars thing is that, um, not having the right materials, not having the right resources. Um, if you're using it as a jumping off point to say, go to the Jovian moons, you're still going to run into the problem that while Mars has less gravity, it still has more gravity than whatever. So taking off from Mars is not going to be easy or it's going to take more fuel or whatever. I think they had it right in one of the, uh, doom movies where they were on the moon. The moon would be a better place to, the one of the moons of Mars would be better to, if you're using it as a jumping off point versus Mars itself. Um, but the other one is that you'd still, because even though the gravity is more, you'd still have the same problems that you'd have, like where they'd be on the International Space Station, where they would still have to use stuff to keep your muscles from atrophying. You would, they, they'd be less impacted on Mars, but you'd still be impacted. And supposedly, well, not supposedly, I know, um, you know, Mars is still an irradiated landscape. Not as bad as, like, you know, Venus, by any means. But still not a desirable place to live. So. Uh -oh. Oh. You know. I don't know. It's all coming down now, Jim. That's all right. That's all right. I'll just put it down here. We'll put it down here. We're... We're getting close to the end anyways. So, by the way, if this podcast has told you anything, kittens can be a pain in the butt sometimes. Yeah, um, so I missed Jim's presentation, so I just want to throw my possible two cents in here. I've been playing the game Terraforming Mars an awful lot lately, and it occurs to me that what we really need to be doing is just increasing our infrastructure in space. Well, I said, I, my, my thing is, if, if you're going to go to mine anything, the best place to go would be the asteroid belt. Well, sure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's part of what I mean. But since we're very likely not just going to tow the asteroids to Earth and drop them in the ocean, like, we're going to do something with them in space. Well, I think towing them back into orbit, or, mo or moon orbit, probably. I don't think you'd want to put them in Earth orbit, because then you're going to be... I think you put them in one of the Lagrange points, they won't go anywhere. Yeah. And then mine the crap out of it. I've seen some pretty neat concepts of them, like, wrapping and enveloping the rocks, pulling them back. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it shouldn't be stupidly difficult to do that, because if, if push comes to shove, we can just strap rocket boosters to them and bring them back. Yeah, well, as long as we don't start doing, like, well, <laughs> I just made me think of strapping a hyperdrive to a asteroid whole Star Wars thing. This isn't the sequel trilogy, Jim. I have better ideas than that. Yeah. But, you know, strapping a rocket to an asteroid and then hurling it at your enemies would be a... Well, sure. That's that's how you win. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever controls the gravity well controls the planet in that scenario, so... The upper part of the gravity well, I should say. Uh, no, that would be the... That would be where I'd try to make the case for Mars, is I'd use it as like a way station of sorts bring things into orbit around there and uh, or crash them into the planet because nothing's there and uh, slice them up or whatever you're going to do and then send those pieces back to Earth 
Well, that's how that's how the movie Dead Space or the game sorry the game Dead Space got started was it was a uh, they were pl- uh, mining ships and they were planet crackers is what they did and when they when they uh, were tearing up this planet's when they found the monolith that or a monolith or a thing or an artifact of the alien origins and that's when people started turning into necromorphs so yeah good times uh, not for the crew but I mean yeah for the People playing the game. Yeah. Well, I've also heard that uh, I saw a guy put forth that it'd actually be easier to terraform Venus than Mars. Well, supposedly you could actually live in the Venus Venetian upper atmosphere in a floating city like Bespin and be all right. Uh, the surface is a hellish landscape of the hottest temperatures in the solar system. Well, they had a plan for that, but yes. My plan is that you just drop a hose down and you just vacuum out. Or no, we build a giant... Uh, made with a vacuum cleaner, stick the vacuum cleaner up to the the atmosphere, suck all the atmosphere out, and... Well, the plan was actually something kind of like that, uh, minus the space balls part. Uh, No, it was essentially to try to leach off the atmosphere out into space. Just just get rid of it, you know? Well, the problem is is that you have to have a way to... You have to have a way to pull it, because otherwise gravity is just going to pull it back down eventually. Because it even if you pumped it into space, the likelihood is that the gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that. And so, that, but that was the general idea. And they're like, "This is easier than these five ideas for trying to do things on Mars." Because the things from Mars, they're like, "Well, uh, even if you could make the surface livable, you still have that whole like no magnetic field thing, basically, or very little." So, what are you going to do? Build a giant solar shield out in space? And they're just like. The guy's always like, get real. Like, that's not going to happen. It's like, the, the thing it had to be gigantic. You'd have to be as big, bigger than the planet. Or, like, it, enough to shield the entire planet. Yeah, yeah, and he's just like, look, like, like, if we could get to this point in structural engineering and everything, like, we could probably just go to another solar system. Uh, so he's like, there's that. There's uh, trying to unlock, I think it was carbon dioxide from the surface. And he's like, yeah, you could do that. But, like, you're going to process X number of tons like per second to to not have it just all bleed off into space. And the problem is that there's nothing in our solar system that is even close to us being able to inhabit. Because Mercury, you'd have to, you'd have to build colonies right on the border of the, you know, and I don't know that you'd want to be that close to the damn sun. Probably uh, not. Venus is the only, Venus and Mars are really the only two options. I think this problem you have with any of the Jovian moons is that the radiation from Jupiter would also be about enough. And I don't think any of them have a strong enough magnetosphere to protect colonies on the planet. Um, I mean, I still think we should go. I think Europa, though, hopefully the not like the movie Europa. You ever see that? That's the one where they, where they land a, um, there's a manned mission to Europa, and they get there, and um, they start seeing like lights in the, like under the surface or whatever. And at the end point, it's like some alien comes, like alien water creature comes in and up through the ship. He survives. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. But you know, I mean, the problem is, or the 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 good thing is with any of those plants is there's always possibility of alien life on them because they're got liquid oceans on them. I don't know if I'd qualify as a good thing, but well, I mean, if you want to say it, it, for those people that want to see, yeah, sorry, it's late, busy day. Um, if, if you're looking for life, that would be a good thing. That's you know. kind of what I was meaning. Um, you know, you got Titan, but again, you have the same problem with, uh, is it Titan? yeah, Titan. Cause that's around Saturn. You have the same problem, radiation from Saturn, which I, but it's less than what it is around Jupiter. Supposedly Saturn would float if you could put it in water. Hmm. I don't know where you're going to get the tub big enough to put Saturn in it, yeah. to, to float it, but um, definitely not nearly as massive. But no, Titan's got methane atmosphere. Um, you know, but it has probably one of the best environments for again you'd still be freezing cold too but it actually has an atmosphere that would protect you and you know that you could i guess
guess technically build something on. I don't know. Yeah, there's just no really good good planets out there for us to be like, yeah, that'd be a good one. So yeah, it's it's either Venus, which is a hellscape, which means you know in our time it's going to be creating something like Bespin floating above it, or Mars. So. Do I think it's still a good idea to go to Mars? Yes, but not for the reasons that people think. I think it's to go and get familiarity with landing and building a colony and using it as some sort of outpost, but you have to understand you're not going to be like mining stuff and blasting it back into space. I mean, even getting a Mars sample back to Earth, which I believe they did or are doing, it's not an easy task. Yeah, well, that's like I said. That's that's why I would consider using it like as a way station. You know, use that as a as a stop point to get to the asteroid belt. You bring materials from the asteroid belt to Mars, using some of them on Mars. You know, because again, like to my mind, if we mine the asteroid belt, that stuff. If it comes back to Earth, it's to build stuff in orbit around Earth. It's not going to be for anything down here on the surface. You know, the thing is, is that I like that whole, like getting it down to the surface in one piece thing is going to be a problem, you know, cause you're, cause you're not going to have a ship big enough to bring enough of it to make it, to make the whole trip worthwhile. Well, yeah, you'd have to mine it. Well, I think you'd have to mine it in space and then send the material back. Well, make, but, but even there, what are you doing? Like, like eight, like a shuttle or whatever can't hold enough to make that even remotely viable for that whole trip. Like it's got to be space elevator. A space elevator is a maybe. Um, yeah, if you can get that to work, that would be helpful. You know, then maybe use the moon as a processing area or something. Well, like I say if they did it right, um, the amount of materials and minerals and stuff that you could get from asteroids. Oh yeah, I even, mean you could you could even in BattleTech they mentioned that the asteroid belt in the in the Earth in the Earth system is enough to like rebuild every single battle mech like 10 times over if they had to. So, well, I think that, I think honestly the, you know, well, one mining, you're not going to be destroying the one planet that we have to try to deal, you know, to, to save, but the amount of minerals and stuff, you could make many things more, more viable, such as, you know, for our purposes, anything out there is infinite. Like it's not, it's not truly infinite, but it may as well be given just the sheer amount of material that's out there. You know, say if you find lithium, well, you can make batteries for days out there and not be stripping down the earth and doing all the I believe platinum and titanium are both uh, in high abundance out there. I know gold is in some places. So. Um, well, don't tell the uh, the people from Battlefield Earth that. I'll well, tell the aliens from Cowboys and Aliens they were after gold also. Hey, don't shake your head. I think Cowboys and Aliens is a much better approach. Yes. Battlefield Earth is just stupid. Oh, what's the one thing that can hurt us? Radiation. What's the universe full of? Radiation. Well, that... Like, their planet should have just exploded being around their sun. Like, <laughs> how does that planet even exist? Our atmosphere ignites and our radiation hits it. That's a giant fiery nuclear reactor orbit, isn't it? Whoops. Solar flare... And we're dead. I mean, having said that, like, the humans came up with the ultimate way to deal with them, you know? Like, good on them. Yeah, and they learned how to fly planes, and... Yeah, I mean, that part's stupid, but, you know... What you that's... The, whole, the whole movie's about I'm, stupid. Look, look, it was all written by L. Ron Hubbard, and it has something to do with Scientology. That's all I know about it, so... Sorry for those of you in Hollywood and South Korea who are followers of Scientology. Not really. Well, you're led by a charlatan who made the whole religion as a result of a bet. I'm dead serious. I know. Like, but, but if you, you believe what you believe, that's what I'm going to say. I'm not. Not on that one. Well, like, no. Like, like the others, like the others, we weren't around 2,000 years ago whenever Jesus supposedly walked the Holy Land. Like, you want to have faith in that? Go for it, you know? No way to disprove that, but... Well, George Michael told me all I need to do is have faith. So did Limp Biscuit. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I 
mentioned in one of the other prior episodes, you're here in good company. Something like 95% of the people on the planet believe in something. You ever see the movie Contact? It's been a while. I know it's on my list of rewatches that I need to have. It's a good movie. Uh, even the even the, the faith-centric parts of it are good. You know, even though it's supposed to be like a more science-driven movie, you know, it does, you know, it does address the fact that, you know, most people do believe in a god of some kind. Well. Because whenever she goes before the council, and one of them asks them about it, I think, it's, I think it is actually Matthew McConaughey, who she has the hots for, but he's also like a religious scholar. And he asks her about that, and, you know, she's an atheist. And uh, so one of the other people on the council is like, well, I mean, you realize you're the one that's actually in the minority here, right? Like, the vast majority of people on the planet believe in something. So if we're going to send a representative to an alien species, like, they need to represent the majority of people on the planet. So, Well, and I had a teacher back in college that told me that, you know, he's like, you like, you know, it, it, it was a way for people that, you know, had, you know, godly views on things. And it's like, where science sometimes doesn't always you know, fit in. He's like, he's like, you know, God is omnipotent. He can do anything. He's like, look at, he's like, look over there. Look at, look at your neighbor. Now look at your other neighbor. Don't you think he could have done better? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that something like that actually came up at loose for forward dinner. Remind me it has to do with chicken. Oh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, because even there at the end of the movie, you know, Matthew McConaughey's character, you know, because she has this experience and she can't prove it. She's she's in the same position, finally. And she's like, I can't prove it, you know, but I know it happened. And I, you know, wish you would believe me. You know, so she's in the same person as a, as, as, in the same position as a believer trying to talk to a non-believer. Well, and at the end, Matthew McConaughey, you know, someone's like, well, what do you think about her? And he's like, look. She and I are both searching for the truth. We're just searching in two different ways, but that's but we're ultimately after the same thing. You the know. you know, and the the one thing that I think makes it easy to you know believe because, like I said, I'm a very skeptical person. So it's like it, sometimes faith comes hard for me because it's hard to have faith when you have to look at things and say, "Well, there's science and all this," but then when you realize like the effort for things to get to where we're at is just astronomical. The percentage of chance of life developing on a planet to this level yeah. is, and it's and not saying that it can't, because, I mean, science can do everything, but you look at how even the Bible is written, how Genesis is written, where we're made from the clay of the earth. And again, I'm not going religious. I'm just going reading from the Bible. That pretty much explains us being made from the materials that were on the earth. Yeah. I mean, so you've got, you've got things like that and, and parts of it. If, if, if for a moment, let's, let's assume that everything written there is at least in the broad strokes. True. Yeah. You know, and you're, you know, all knowing, all powerful God up on high, you know, you want to tell your believers something, but they have like, not even Bronze Age level understanding of anything, you're not going to be like, oh yeah, you know, the the nucleotides came together and created single-celled organisms, and through the process of evolution over the last four and a half billion years, now you guys are here. No, you're going to say something like, I created you out of clay. You know, you're, you're going to tell them something they can understand. Yeah, so that, that's you what know. I'm saying, is that there is intelligent design in, in it. Same thing, like people are like, well, the seven days, that's like seven days for who? Because supposedly our lives are an instant to God. That would make seven days a really, really long time. Right. Uh, as, as long as, as long as you accept that most of it is probably not to be taken literally or like not the way we would directly interpret it, you know, and especially a number of the stories, as long as you understand they're parables yeah. trying to tell you like, this is the way you should live your life. Don't do what these people did. Well, yeah, and stuff. that's the thing, like, and again, I, I don't want anybody to feel like I'm, we're push, I'm pushing faith or anything like that. I'm just saying it's the way that my mind interprets and why I believe it's not anything like saying, no, you got to believe it's though. Yeah. Though I think faith is good for people, but the, um, the thing is, is that, um, 
is like the way that some of the stuff is written. And maybe it's just the way it was interpreted over years where people actually understood some of the stuff. But I mean, and there's just been some things in my life that's happened um, that have, I don't know if I, I think if I didn't have my faith in something that I would have probably not been able to be where I'm at now. And uh, the big one is, you know, that I had a daughter that passed away. So, um, and some people are like, well, that should be a reason why faith isn't there, because how could that happen? How could somebody let that happen? But it is what it is, and um, I think my faith is what got me through all of that time. So, um, tough stuff, but, no, I can say, I can say that, I, I, but I do understand why people have a hard time believing, because the thing is, is that people say that if there is someone, if there is a higher power looking down, why is the world the way it is? Why is the world at war? Why are people killing each other? Why are people doing this and that? And well, that, that it's is, a hard thing to explain. That, that is Neil deGrasse Tyson's approach, is that either there isn't a God, in which case we're responsible for everything, or there is, and said supreme being chooses not to, inter, to uh, interact and therefore allows all the bad stuff to happen, and in his mind, therefore, is not worthy of worship. So, and I, think, I mean, I, I, I totally get that outlook. And I, I and like I said in the one press, you know, I consider myself basically agnostic. Like, I don't know if there is or isn't. You know, I've seen things that lead me to believe yes, I've seen a lot of things that lead me to believe no. You know, but I do find the topic fascinating to discuss sometimes. Yeah, no, no, and like I said, the discussion I'm having is, you know... Not proselytizing, you're just talking. Yes, it, yeah, I, like I said, I believe, but that doesn't mean that I'm like, you know, and, well, being being raised Catholic, there's a lot of stuff I don't agree with with the Catholic religion. Hey, stop shit on me. I think my cat is trying to tell me, though, that we have talked long enough. Hold on, this. dude, we're almost there. I'm going to tell you what it's going to taste. Okay, so tell me your, your okay, thoughts. Okay, so in the show Loose for something came up that's very funny. Uh, God at one point is like, hey, so I'm going to go down to Earth and, you know, because my sons are wreaking havoc and I'm going to put an end to this and figure out what all the problems are. And so he decides that the best thing for everybody is if they get together to have dinner. So it's God, it's God, three of the angels, and the psychiatrist that Lucifer is seeing because she has a baby with one of the angels. But God also wanted to see his grandson. And uh, they have this big, like, uh oh. <laughs> we gotta leave that in. Yeah, yeah, we'll leave that in. All right. So they're having this big, they have this big hubbub there and during the dinner. And uh, God mentions that he really likes the chicken that they're having. And the psychiatrist just starts laughing out of the blue. And uh, they all just turn and stare at her. She's like, the chicken, I figured it out. It's your favorite. That's why everything tastes like chicken. God's favorite. Yeah. You know, and they'll just look at her like, you've lost your mind, woman. But I was like, that's, that's actually really funny. You know? Well, well, I think my cat, besides knocking over the camera, which we're going to leave in, cause that was awesome. <laughs> uh, this kitten, um, uh, has decided that it's probably time to, uh, end this meeting and we've rambled on long enough. Yeah. I don't um, think we hit the three hour mark this time. Though. No, not, not quite. But you know, Definitely let us know what you, uh, you know, think about the topics discussed down in the comments down below. Uh, do the normal YouTube stuff, the like, comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, if you happen to enjoy the kitten, you know, annoying the crap out of us and knocking the camera over. Almost the second time there. Almost the second time. You know, we'll have him on more often. Um, eh, let's not, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping not. Uh, I would put him into a, um, into a, would have locked him in another room, but. The problem is, if I would have done that, he probably would have uh, either went crazy or uh, decided to, you know, defecate, a, defecate in one of the, uh, the rooms. So, uh, but yeah, he's only been here for two days, so it's been a little bit of an interesting ride. So, anyways, um, yeah, this is going to end that, and uh, man, maybe we'll get some subscribers from the camera falling over. That's yeah, good stuff. maybe. It's good. I'll make a clip out of that. Yes. All right. Well, anything else? Um, nope. Nothing I can think of. All right. Well, then we'll end this meeting, and we'll see you in uh, episode eighteen.
All right. See you folks later. See you.